GF, welcome to Funkatopia. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Obviously, we're doing the pre-show. I am your host, Mr. Christopher. Here's my illustrious co-host, Mr. Jeff Page. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're going to have some fun tonight. We got the amazing Mick Murphy in the house, and we're going to get him on. Of course, we start the show at 8 o'clock, but you guys know I always go through this rigmarole that we start the show a little bit early so we can kind of get everybody in. So we're not like starting the show and just ramming everything down your throat because this is live. This is right. very, very different. Uh, not a lot of shows are done like this. And it's just because live is so dangerous. You can say whatever. And then it's like, nope, oh, two ads out there. So uh, that is, that is a reality of what we do here. And, and you uh, know, we've been advised to like very, various times have been like, you know, you do your show live, you know, you, you really shouldn't do it live. You wouldn't, you need to control it. <laughs> well, you, know, you did say that. It's you like, know, you did say that. <laughs> yeah, I remember if he, that's the reason why it's best to watch the show live. Cause you have no idea. <laughs> okay. Let me just say, I clicked on a broadcast that we did a, a, some years ago on, um, I, we did some years ago about messed up lyrics. Oh. We were talking about uh, we were talking about Prince's "We Can Funk," and the, <laughs> and I'd gladly be in <laughs> and we were like, and one of the things I said is that man George Clinton sure does like to talk about P more than R. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Why yeah, did you, I say that? Yeah, you could have kept that in the closet. You could, but, but I was, I but I was live, and so there was no taking it back. No, no, <laughs> no. Just, that's the reason why. And I never edited it out. It's it stayed in there in perpetuity. So it's just uh, good. Uh, I know, go go yeah, ahead. I know we're in the pre-show, so uh, make want to make sure we get to acknowledge everybody. And yes. uh, I can't wait to thank people for uh, helping broadcast the, uh, the event that happened uh, yesterday's event as well too. So, uh, you know, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be a nice day. It's going to be an awesome night. And there's already a message for Mick uh, yes. in the, in the chat room already from step balcony Academy. Oh, and yeah. I will make sure that um, he, I, 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 I can see him. I, I, he's in the green room right now. He's waiting. So at, when we get to eight o'clock, you know, we play our new our new intro. We play the old intro for the pre-show, and then we play the new intro for the regular show. But uh, Mick, I know you can see this, so let me put up this message for you. That's all uh, for you, man. Says, hey, Mick, I'm jumping in early because this will be 2 a.m. my time, and Geezer's got to sleep. I just wanted to say it was a blessing working with such a gifted and giving talent. I hope to tune in. So I'm just uh, letting you know that it's there and I, 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 I see you laughing and acknowledging and I want to bring you in, but we got, it's got, we have an entrance for you. For those who don't know tonight, we have Mick Murphy, the amazing voice yes, of yes, the yes. system. Don't disturb this group. One of my childhood yeah. heroes. Come on, they didn't want to sing. Just stop. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's system. And of course, we're going to talk about some little projects that kind of happen before the system. Uh, also, we're going to be talking about this project that's not new, but just released an album in June mm. of this year. And most of this album was recorded back in 1993. Which they got their own vault. Was, it, it, yeah, it was a, the Mighty Soulmate, which was a super group of Andre Simone, um, Mick Murphy, St. Paul Peterson, and Gardner Cole. If you met, not familiar with Gardner Cole, um, he d he does a lot of songwriting. He has he has a couple of solo albums, but he did uh, probably one of his best known songs uh, is by Madonna. That open your heart, I'll make you love me. So he does a lot of writing for a lot of different uh, things. So, anyways, um, the super group, and nobody knew about him. This was recorded back in 1993, and then. Um, they just didn't do anything with it. It just sat there and then it was <laughs> finally released in 2021, like, you know, over 30, you know, 30 years, almost 30 years later, volume one. And then now volume two has come out, which I believe was, is some more tracks from that same recording session. That's why I got to kind of get to the bottom of, but yeah. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to have some fun. We may even bring up Spotify and, and, and play a couple little snippets or whatever, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a great, great show tonight. Also, we're going to talk about the, um, in the news section, we're going to talk about the 
inauguration of the Prince Rogers Nelson Highway Memorial mm -hmm. Highway that happened yesterday, which we did live right here. Yes. Um, and then, which I was surprised nobody else was doing it live. I saw a couple of photographers there, but I didn't really see other any real. I was like, why are we the only people here? Um, What's that all about? I don't know. Uh, I, I think it's, again, because MnDOT kind of jumped the gun and put all the signs out on Thursday of last week. And everybody was like, they're out. And we're like, it's not supposed to be out. It's just supposed to be an unveiling that happens on Monday. <laughs> oh, well. A little, a little premature there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your prince will do that to you. <laughs> yeah, prince is, yeah, prince is still messing with us from the still from the messing with you. Uh, yeah. So, and then we're also going to be talking about some other stuff too. Um, I don't remember like every little single thing that we have on our notes, but um, yeah. we got a lot of stuff that we want to cover. Um, what? Why is the old? Um. Okay. <laughs> it just seemed like there was some notes on here that were an old, old thing. Okay. Um, they weren't, there weren't, I, I saw the Cardi B microphone thing, but that's a new thing that you just added. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about the Jennifer Aniston, and Jamie Foxx beef. Uh, <laughs> I, while I do want to talk about the whole debacle that happened in Montgomery <laughs> with the, with the uh, boat, the big brawl that broke out. I, I don't, I just don't know that I have the energy to talk about it. I just don't, I don't know where to go with this other than it's like, it's not like you take sides in this. It's just like, man, there was so many, so many people wrong in the mix. Yeah. Like pretty much everybody. That's wrong. And what's funny about it is that nobody was arrested. They were detained momentarily, but everybody walked away with misdemeanors. And, but I was just like, I saw a man walk over and hit a woman over the head with a chair. How is how's that a misdemeanor? How is this what? how's that a slap on the wrist? <laughs> I mean, there was a bunch of craziness happening, but uh, you know, you know, that's what happens when you you know get some <laughs> drunk rich white folks <laughs> in a boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much <laughs> there'll be problems happening. I can't I can't uh, even argue with you on it. <laughs> <laughs> You know how we are. I <laughs> mean, how you do. <laughs> you know how we do. Um, <laughs> it was everybody was doing what they do. Yeah, everybody was. The, the was, true uh, self or selves great. came out. That's yeah. what that and they were, uh, of course, the one we're sitting here talking about it anyways on this pre show. Oh, uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to talk about it, but we we're talking about it anyways. The guy that jumped off of the boat and swam to the dock, <laughs> they called Black Aquaman, is what they called him. Black Aquaman. Just, yeah, totally <laughs> oh, look, it's Black Aquaman because he got he jumped off of a boat, saw what was going on, jumped off a boat, swam across, jumped up on the dock, and then started fighting people. And it's like, hey, if you listen like real close to the video footage, he was like, eh, eh. <laughs> he was, <laughs> okay, I don't have the I don't I don't have a dolphin sound effect. Eh. I, I I would help you out. This is the closest thing I have. <laughs> That's the closest I got. He was he was straight up flipper. All right. Okay. It is eight o'clock. So you guys know what we got to do. We got to minimize ourselves and then we'll go ahead and come in with the official, official whatnot, but we still didn't do any shout outs. I mean, Krista, what's going on? Lawrence, what's going on? Cammy. All you fine folks. Veronica, Ryan. Cammy is in there. Cammy, your package is in the mail. Did you get it? I hope you got it. Um, Brian, all you fine folks, all you folks that are always normally here and uh, good to see you. And we're going to talk about all that stuff and more, but first we're gonna go right into bringing on Mick Murphy, but you know how we gotta do it. We're gonna remove ourselves from here and start it so that the editing is very easy. We'll see you in just a second. <laughs> All right, here we go. I just saw your message, Jeff. <laughs> welcome to Funkatopia. WTF. Welcome to Funkatopia. Oh, shoot. Hold on. 
Hey, folks on the Funk Shop app, how are you? I always forget to turn you guys on, but I'm turning you on now. Welcome to Funkatopia Live. It's Mr. Christopher WTF. Welcome to Funkatopia. I am your host, Mr. Christopher, like I already said, and this is my illustrious co-host, Mr. Jeff Page. <laughs> and uh, you know what's so funny? I love when we go to like, we'll go to like Paisley Park or we'll go to like some other, you know, some other type of event and it's like, I was like, and this is Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Fit, 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 fit. Yeah. <laughs> lose, I always lose my voice. I have to get my fern sound. <laughs> it follows you everywhere. I'm just like, I'm so sorry. That's the reason why I never did anything like that. Uh, I don't know why I did it. Now I can't stop. Yeah, yeah. Now it's just part of your thing. All right, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, thank you so, so much for joining us here. It is going to be an amazing night. We are so glad that you joined us. We are having uh, a lot of fun here tonight. We've got a lot of news and whatnot to talk to you about, but we're not doing that first. We oh, Typically in these types of situations, we save the news for last, uh, especially when we have such an amazing guest tonight uh one that both both jeff page and myself have uh followed and he's just got he just had this silky smooth just, voice and just i mean it was just i mean oh my god he was just he was just the man it was just it was just even it, it was so surprising that when mick murphy uh came onto the scene to everybody uh, with the system. He had been doing a lot of things before then, right. but most people, including myself, admittedly, did not hear him until right. you are in my system, my system came on the radio and were like, but his, who, who his is voice, this? the, the silky, the voice, the vocals in the, and the music, the match was so perfect. You know what I mean? Like it belonged so it's, it was like who, it, it, it's very it? rare that right and it's very rare that somebody can do that yeah when there's just two of them you know mm -hmm. I, there's not a lot of duos that can pull that off i mean eurythmics i can think of eurythmics i can think of the yeah. system that's it <laughs> that's it that's i oh no uh the white stripes i mean there's some people that just like it's like when they pull it off it's just wow it's just amazing but anyways i am so honored to have the one and only Mick Murphy uh, here. And he is literally probably one of the coolest vocalists of, of that time yeah. <clears throat> and still doing stuff to this day and still kicking it. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm not even going to gush anymore. Yes. Please welcome the one and only Mick Murphy to the Funkatopia live stage. Hey, hey, what's up, Funkatopia? What's up, Chris? <laughs> Jeff, how you doing? We're doing, doing fantastic, awesome. man. Look at you looking all dapper, man. You know, I got to put a little something on. <laughs> man, I got to get sunglasses. <laughs> yeah, see, that's what we should have done. We should have. Now, I didn't make myself bring in the make Mick bigger. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Well, Mick, you know, I, I kind of want to get into it because man i have wanted to interview for the longest time and it just so happened that somebody had sent me a link to volume two of the mighty soulmates uh -huh. <clears throat> I was like, oh who's the mighty soulmates and i checked it out and then i started reading and i was just like oh saint paul peterson's in this band that's pretty cool mm -hmm. it may have been paul that sent it to me and then i said andre simone's in this band too what yes like, what and then yes and i was like gardner cole and mick Mar i was like what's happening here how do and how is this volume two uh yeah. so it was like one of these things and I, I don't know if it was a i don't know if it was a, a marketing scenario or or what it was but it, it was just I, I i hadn't heard of it and i was just like you, we need to remedy this like immediately right and so it is an honor to have you on and we're going to talk about all of those things but before we get any further how are you how you feeling Ex excellent everything's good brother all good mr christopher uh, i love the studio i love the setup you got there uh, i got my my noise makers back here too yeah i see and I, I see the chaotic eyeball you got going yeah on i there. get i get yeah yeah i get i get kind of messy in here but this is my writing room and you know, it has touchstones and photos of things I love and yes. a lot of toys to play with and get inspiration from. Um, but, I, you know, this is my haven in my house. Yes. Yeah. I, I, like I actually, and you're up in New York right now, right? 
That's correct. I live in East Harlem. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. that that, that yeah. area has changed. Ah. <laughs> that, uh, that area has changed drastically. <laughs> not so much. I really? mean, not as much as the rest of Harlem, but you know, I think that's a good thing. Mm. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right. That's good yeah. too. Yeah. I unfortunately I have a green screen behind me. I used to have people used to be able to see all my musical instruments and pictures and photos and stuff, but I was just like, man, I don't want to have to keep my office clean every single time I do a show. So I put a green screen behind me. So uh, <laughs> now, now I got to, um, I've got to consider my choices. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's get yep. to it. Let them see it, baby. Let them see what you're doing. Uh, all right. <laughs> Welcome to uh, your world. Mick Murphy. Let's talk because I want to kind of get into the history of it. And uh, obviously, you know, Jeff Page, I want to make sure you kind of keep an eye on the the, the chat area. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. there's, there's some people that are already saying hello to you and, and giving you giving you shouts out and whatnot. It's, What's uh, up, Jared, Jason? It's like Jared, Jared, George. Jared George. Okay, got it. I'm yeah, there's, uh, yeah, on. yeah. Greta's in the mix, and you saw the you saw the earlier message from Step Balcony Academy. Mm -hmm. Yep, Played I did. Yeah, that's great, man. See, Balcony was an engineer at Science Lab Studios and cut a lot of our um, tracks as the system. Oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. Yep, okay. Yep. I think he's in Sweden now, or I'm not exactly sure where, but um, someplace in Europe. Yeah, it's it, London is very, we, we have a lot of, obviously funk is really, really big over there, and it always has been. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I was placed in the wrong spot, but uh, funk is really, really big over there, so we have a lot of guests. Like I have, I've had Jamiroquai on the show, Oh, and, I love that. Um, and and they are. It, it's like two o'clock in the morning there, so scheduling interviews is always is always. Yep. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you were very very active in the music scene in the Northeast. So you know, one of the things I want to do apologize ahead of time is if I mess up some of the timeline here, but I really kind of want to start in your early childhood and kind of understand, you know, what what was your family situation like. And were any of your family members into music or the, into the music industry at all? What, what was that like for you? Yeah. Um, no, I don't have any really in any direct from my cousin, Bernard Fowler. Uh, I don't know if you know him. He's an incredible singer. He's been working with the Rolling Stones for like 35, 36 years. Um, the, he was in the Peach Boys. We kind of grew up together and we got that affinity for music very early on. Um, I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, and there were so many funk bands in my neighborhood. <clears throat> I had um, uh, Ronnie Drayton. I don't know if you know that name. He lived like two blocks from me. Um, Eddie Martinez was in a group called uh, Mother Night. That was one of our groups that we looked up to during the time. Um, had a lot of bands, every block. Because we had houses and garages, we had a lot of bands that played in practice in their house and garage hmm wow so it, you know it's just it's just so amazing thinking about how active you were in the music scene from the very very beginning um and you just kind of just really enveloped yourself into the music and just started working with bands and just trying to just it, it just seemed like the more that i read about you 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 kind of found ways to kind of weave yourself in and out of in and out of different yeah I'm, I'm a weaver i try to make relationships with people <laughs> and i i get in where i fit in i mean um kind of growing up when you're in a band you learn how to do everything um i went to i went to this school brooklyn tech which was um you know it was, it was one of the top high schools in the city um vernon reed went there Oh, um, yeah, love learning. Yeah. Raymond Jones was there at the time I was there. Miles J. I don't know if you know Miles J, the singer. But one of the things I got out of that is that I'd never had a fear of building or making anything to make our band show great. I mean, I built our light board, I put together our sound system. So it was always, I was always trying to move the game forward and a lot of it was we promoted our own shows um you know i know I, I hear the same spirit when i talk to andre about how they came up doing gigs and promoting their own shows and making their own shows and i had a mom much like andre's mom who was like a momager she would get us gigs at all these clubs as a floor show because there were a lot of um a lot of the mothers were in social clubs 
So I came up through that kind of system. Yeah, those momagers can be very, very powerful. <laughs> right? They get they get things done. I'm sorry, I keep losing my ear set. No, that's all right. Those momagers are very, very powerful. Oh, very, they important. Can, uh, well, very I mean, important. Look at different careers, uh, you know, like with – uh, just it happened with Justin Bieber, uh, also Britney Spears. It's like uh, their moms get involved, and it's just they just kind of go right into it and and yeah, we, they just make things happen. And they don't take no for an answer, right? right? <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, they're they your never, biggest fan. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, my mom, my mom really pushed me into music. I was kind of a tech head, egghead, but I also could sing at a very early age. So she would like. She would just like get me, she got me into the first band I was in, the Soul Shakers, because she was friends with the guitar player's mother. Lorraine Fontaine was my mother's running buddy. So they had these social clubs and my mother and her were in social clubs together and they would always work it out so that our band would be the opening band whatever for whatever big band they had at the show. And that's kind of how it all began doing Jackson Five covers and doing whatever soul songs were out at the time. Um, that's kind of the early beginnings. Wow, that's really cool. So let's let's take a moment because it's time to get sassified here. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Tell me about the Jack Sass band, but but before we do, wow. I want to play I want to play 45 seconds of a Jack Sass band track called Much Too Much. Take, take mm. a listen to this, folks. So, so right out of the gate, I can't even, yeah. I, I can't even, how, how I missed that song over all these years and just, right. and in general, it's like, man, where, where was I? You got to tell me the story about Jack Sass band and, and. Wow. That's wow. A- wow. 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 Okay. So <laughs> once again, through my growing experience, um, first it was the Soul Shakers, which is a band with Robert Fontaine. And from there, I started getting really serious about music and about putting together ba- the band, rehearsing, learning songs, kind of doing originals. And you know what happens? It's like you, as you're progressing, some people do, are not making that music front and center to their existence. And I kind of was. And during that process, <clears throat> I met a kindred spirit, Lala, La Forest Cope from East Elmhurst, who ended up writing You Give Good Love, um, uh, which was and, and, and not to interrupt, but the Forest Cope is in the chat room right now. And <laughs> <Yes>. Hey, Lala! <laughs> I made our banner. Lala! With, <laughs> Lala says, I made our banner with studs and my mom let us practice. <laughs> she sure did. She sure did. It's the truth. But and, more than go. that, Lala right. inspired me because she was Scorpio and very pushy. And I was more Capricorn organizing and, you know, making sure the technical aspects of being in a band were together. But Lala always had this, well, why can't we? She always had that kind of an attitude. Mm-hmm. So when we, when we got her, um, first of all, we joined Jack Sass. They were already a band. But when we joined them, we had the attitude that we're going to make them bigger than they are. We're going to make this band big. So, you know, we started really... Gran Omar Hakim actually was the drummer in the early iteration of that band. So that band was Liz Chisholm, a very well-known female bass player and singer, song songwriter. Uh, Vic Vaughn, who, you know, it's it's really strange because I had the I had the great honor of going on the road during the Rick James Prince tour with a band called Clear. But seeing Prince it made me realize that we had our own Prince, uh, Vic Vaughn, was basically Prince on the East Coast, 
same thing, songwriter, guitar player, amazing energy. And he was in our band. He was a guitar player and one of the singers. Um, so we started pushing forward. And, you know, I, I realized during that time that we were playing all the clubs in New York um, with groups like Kinky Fox, um, Johnny mm -hmm. Kemp, who passed away sadly a few mm -hmm. years ago. Um, I realized that we couldn't get a record deal even though we were killing it in the clubs, like we were really good. We, we made a couple of demo tapes and we couldn't get a record deal. So I went off to work with this guy, Fred Petrus, who had this, he was Italian. He came here from Italy. He had this band Change with Luther Vandross. So through that situation, I started becoming more aware that you have to write your own songs, you have to publish your own songs, record your own songs. And, and our band Jack's Ass was more of a, funk rock band this song was not typical of the kind of stuff we did we were much more rocky you know we were listening yeah. to bands like mother's finest and we we were rocking out oh yeah but Love that. working with with fred and change i i was like hmm, maybe we need to write something that has that kind of soul vibe that's happening right now to get in because you know you you can't you can't get in loud you got to get in smooth and soft so lala mm. and i wrote this song much too much and i think it was the the real first song that broke jack's ass in terms of being able to you know have a record and we did that demo a track demo at the same demo studio that fred petrus used for his bands ah, i see wayne cobham what's yeah. up wayne <laughs> this is one of our cohorts we had a great horn section at one point wayne cobham trumpet player uh, out of Rochdale was uh, one of the lead horn players in the group, man. Hey, Wayne, what's up? He said they were afraid of you. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little, I was a little squirt. I really was. I was like the, I was like the, the baby of the band in some ways, but I was like, we're going to rehearse. We're going to rehearse three days a week. If we don't rehearse three days a week, we're not going to be any good. So I was kind of a little, it's kind of a little twerp. <laughs> So did you have any personal time, you know, with Prince to get a chance to talk to him while, while you guys were, were kind of doing the. Um, no, but when we, when I went on that tour, I was the road manager for the group clear and they right. were the opening act. That so during that tour, I did meet Andre. So he was, you know, I, I'm a tour, I'm a road tour manager. I'm on the side of the stage. No artists pay attention to you at all. But for right. some reason, one day going backstage, I'm, that's where I initially met Andre Simone. And we've been really solid kindred spirits ever since, man. Man, that's really cool. Now, there, I think you were talking about, um, I guess, the, the gentleman that, that you compared to, to Prince on the... On the yeah, Vic Vaughn. Yes. I think that uh, Lala says Vic still has his band in the Midwest. Yes, he does. Yeah. He ended up moving to Missouri. Um, he's part Cherokee Indian. He moved to Missouri and he's still like gigging and doing shows and doing his thing. What's up, Vic wow. Vaughn, if you can hear me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there, yeah, there are so many people in here that we don't normally see in the chat room. We we, we there's normally like a you know, a hundred plus people in here when we do our live shows, and of course it grows from there once it gets yeah. on Spotify and iHeartRadio and all that stuff. But we do the live shows, you know, we normally see like a lot of the same names, but there's a lot of love for you. And I can tell that some of these <laughs> folks, some of these folks are not, you know, it, not, our <laughs> not our regulars. Great. No, I mean, look, I, I grew up with a lot of love. Um, we really, in these bands, we really loved each other, man. It was, it was us against the world. That's it. Jack Sass, yeah. Vic Vaughn, Liz Chisholm, Lala, and, Mick Murphy. So, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we were we were a really kick-ass band. And I think we influenced a lot of the local bands because we came after during the, the previous generation, they were doing more soul and floor shows, mm -hmm. um, kind of slick funk bands. Uh you know, the fat bag band, you ever hear of them? Oh yeah. Yeah. They they lived they lived right up Linden, but they rehearsed right up Linden Boulevard. There were bands like Creative Funk. I mean, just tremendous, real monster musicians. But we kind of brought our own show. We had our own sound system, our own light system. So as a result of that, we were able to kind of spread out, play a lot of clubs in Jersey and Long Island. And we really had a lot of love and a lot of ferocity um as a team, you know, that do or die spirit. What's up, Sunday sermon? 
Yes, 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 Norman McHugh. What's up, my brother? Um, <laughs> we had a lot of love for each other, and uh, it showed in our music. It was really Jack's ass do or die. Uh, DJ Danny G asked, uh, what was the song we just played? That was Much Too Much by the Jack Sass Band. You can actually, you can, I don't know if you guys are on Spotify or not. I, I actually was able to locate that mm-hmm. on, uh, on YouTube. And, um, I'm and, uh, pretty oh, sure it is on Spotify. But, you know, there's a lot, of, there's yeah, a lot there's of vinyl. Of it, can uh, be, it can be found. Here's somebody else, Matt Perry Thomas, who says, really miss you, brother. Yeah, I miss you too, baby. What's up, man? Hope all is good. And here's Greta. Is Greta looking gorgeous? <laughs> lana, lana. What's up, Greta? I see you tagged LaForest Co. That's yeah, my, that's my, hey, LaForest, Lala, that's my partner in crime. We and it's like, all, like this, all this love, Robert. I love Robert it. Feaster. Oh, yeah, Robert oh, Feaster. He was, a, he was one of our engineers at Science Lab. What's up, Rob? Love to hear from you, brother. Yeah, Holla man. at me, okay? So, the Jack. So let's talk about the Jack Sass Band for a second, because you know, again, it, just like you said, you're doing pretty well up in the Northeast, and um, you said much too much wasn't typical of the sound that you guys had. But you know, it seems like everything that I saw, whenever a song from Jack Sass Band would come up, it would be pigeonholed as disco. Mm. No, we weren't. No, we didn't play disco. Well, we had a couple songs yeah. that. Um, that kind of because of the way we recorded them, like it was, look, we were trying to get in. We were trying to get on any way possible. And, you know, like the man says, you, you know, you, you, um, you kind of fake it till you make it. So we were able to do many genres of music, but the real heart and soul of Jack Sass was kind of funk rock. That was mm-hmm. really what we wanted. That, that was the centerpiece of our show. Um, our, our motto was Jack's ass kicks ass. And, and we brought it. We brought it. I mean, there are a lot of bands from Queens and Jamaica who would come to our shows and really looked up to our style of performance. And some of them, you know, copied what we did. And um, it was just a really tight community. And uh, we, we had a we had a kick ass band. And uh, yeah, Wayne Wayne says we'd pack into Lala's Mercury Cougar and travel the U.S. Yes, we did. <laughs> and I I was I was fortunate because I was able to buy this bread van that we called the Blue Bitch. It was basically a GMC bread van, and we would put all the gear, the sound, the lights, and we would be able to lay on top of it and go to do all these gigs. Man, it was it was it was great times, man. It really was great times, full of adventure and um and great music. Now, tell me about the song Supersonic Sexalicious Funky <laughs> Amadocious. Yeah, that's kind of central to the kind of funk we were doing. Um, <laughs> you know, that was a hook. It was a great hook. <laughs> Supersonic Sexalicious. It was a pretty cool song. You have it? No, I, 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 <laughs> We can pull it up. Oh, okay. we can pull oh, it yeah, up. Don't worry it. about it. Yeah, we can definitely pull it up. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, not saying, but I have to think that Prince may have been inspired by that just because of the fact that you know, obviously, that song that you that you just did a little piece of came out in 1979, mm-hmm. and Prince's uh, Super Funka Califragile Sexy came out in 1988. I mean, hey, he might he might have been. It. Listen, it's really odd because. I had no idea who Prince was. I never heard of Prince until very when sexy. Um, I want to be your lover. That was my first hearing, first time hearing Prince when that came out, mm-hmm. and that was right at the point when I was like, "They're in Minneapolis. They're doing the same shit we're doing." I mean, basically, <laughs> it was the same type of shit we were doing. It was like, uh, you know, we had synth horns, we had live horns in the band it was funk bass bass popping courtesy of liz chisholm double l a double z chisholm um it was so similar that i was like this is weird they're like doing the same shit we're doing um and then you know that's that's what it is i don't know if you went back and listened to the jack test band but we had some funky shit we did yeah and actually uh let me let me see if I can if I can uh, play a little taste of it.
Yes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was funky, yeah. right? Yeah, that's yes. yeah, that's that had a little yeah, those that change those changes in there were very uh Parliament desk that yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, absolutely oh, it's a sliding vocal and we recorded that <laughs> on on a four track tape machine. So there's a lot of there's a lot of degradation, but we did a lot of ping ponging because we didn't have the money to go in the studio at that time. We did a couple things mm. in the recording studio, um, maybe three or four songs in the recording studio. But after that, we were like, hey, I bought a T a, a TAC Tascam 434S, and I was like. We can do it. We can just ping pong the songs. We can make a record. <laughs> <laughs> bounce the tracks. Just bounce yep. the tracks. <laughs> no, tracks were no let's bounce it again. The drums are too loud. That's but right. I mean, was, <laughs> too late. You already we didn't know any, I didn't know anything about compression. I knew I knew nothing other than the will to do it and to convince my 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 bandmates, my my partners in crime that we could, you know, that we could do it. And um, that's awesome. You know, man. that's that that record. Well, you were right. right. Well, let's see if this <laughs> if this picture means anything to you, and to see if you can tell me the story about who these folks are. This is the Peter Jacks band. Oh, Peter! Ja oh, yeah, I got it there. Peter that's Jacques? a great story. Peter yeah. Jacks band. Yes. So, tell me about yeah. this because uh, how you met, got involved with some of the crew that was working for them, and and then obviously the ties of what was yeah. known as the Little Macho Publishing Company. Yeah, Little Macho Music. So, like I said, I was in Jack's ass. We, we couldn't get a couldn't get a record deal. I didn't know anything about publishing. I didn't know anything about any of that. So, at some point, a gentleman we knew in New York used to come see us a lot. We played at this club called The Cellar. He said, hey, my I have a friend in Italy who's coming here. He has a band, Peter Jacques Band, but they're not really a band. Um, he wants to meet with you about fronting as the bands. And that was the Jack's ass band. So um, Fred Petrus comes to New York. We meet in this hotel uh, in the forties at a bar. And, um, you know, he's, he's talking about Peter Jacques band who I've never heard of, but you know, we were trying to get on. So we said, I, I want you, I want your band Jack's ass to be Peter Jacques, to be the Peter Jacques band. <laughs> um, and then he said, but you know, you know all the musicians in town. Why don't you come work for me? I'll teach you publishing. I'll teach you production, and mm. you can, you know, hook me up with all the musicians in town. And I did know a lot of the, a lot of the musicians. Timmy Allen. Um, you know, we we had a lot of bands in that circle that were kind of playing the circuit. There was a club called Leviticus, and there was a Cellar, and we kind of rotated playing one night uh it would be kinky fox and another night it might be us and there were several bands that did it so i did i was like you know what there's this is one way to learn about recording and about publishing and all that so i worked for fred god uh, for for two years during that time um he had several hits he had big hits um with the band change luther vandross actually uh we sang backgrounds on that first change album on a few songs, um, hmm. you know, because of the relationship. And, you know, he, he didn't have the best reputation among a lot of the musicians in New York because, you know, he, he didn't pay, but he always paid me and actually actually always overpaid me. Um, wow. That's so a, wow. I had a, I had an okay relationship with him and that was a springboard for me to move on. I actually first met David Frank in that office because we were mm. doing recording sessions and Kashif, um, I don't, you know who Kashif is, right? Mm -hmm. Kashif? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Okay, so he would do a lot of the sessions on the various bands, Change and BBQ. Mm. And one day, David Frank called. <clears throat> he had seen me at the sessions because a lot of times Fred wouldn't go to the sessions, but he would tell me, go down, make sure they're getting it done. Not that I knew, you know, he had Mario Malavesi, incredible musicians. Um, but he said, just go down to the studio. And I think David was playing on one of the sessions and he saw me and he called me one day and said, Hey, um, you know, I, I, I would give you, I would give you a, a fee if you could hook me up with, with sessions, you know, on some of the recordings. So I said mm -hmm. to him, you know, I, I, look, I'll hook you up just to hook you up. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't charge you a fee for that. If something comes along, I'm ha happy to recommend you. And then I didn't see him for, 
a few years after that. The next time I saw him, uh, at that point, I was road managing the band Clear, and uh, Dennis King, who's a mastering engineer at Atlantic, who was really my mentor um, after school from Brooklyn Tech, I would go to Atlantic Studios and hang out and ride home with Dennis King because he lived in my neighborhood. So I got to see some incredible recording sessions. Like everybody who came through Atlantic Studios of when they were on oh, um, sure. 59th Street. It was just an amazing time for me. Uh, I get, and also I want to, I want to shout out Jimmy Douglas. <clears throat> Jimmy Douglas was also a very early mentor and, you know, he pushed our band and they took us for the first time to record Jack's ass. They took us to the studio in Washington, DC and we recorded a couple songs and um, they were very instrumental in, uh, you know, my, my, learning the business of music so anyway at some point i'm road managing clear mm -hmm. and i'm mm -hmm. road managing change on the road and i have three bands on the road <laughs> that i'm tour managing i've changed bbq and um change bbq and clear um so i, I don't know why i did that little sideline but that's kind of how i started moving on at one point I decided I wanted to make my own music and um, we're on the road with clear and David Frank, he, he, his recollection is that he heard me sing. He didn't know I was a singer, um, but I had been singing in bands and I kind of took a little break to try to learn the music business. Mm. And out of the blue one day he called me and said, Hey, I, I wrote this track that Madonna was going to sing, but she backed out at the last minute. And um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if you would sing it. And I was like, great. <laughs> I'm like, I'd love to. No, so now I, I got to preface it with, <clears throat> I had this idea that music was kind of changing from the kind of soul funk we were doing at the time to what was coming out of the UK. You mentioned the Eurythmics. You mentioned mm -hmm. groups like that. That's where my head was at. I was reading NME every day. I was checking the bands that were coming out of the UK, the punk bands, the electro bands. Oh, so yeah. my dream in my mind <clears throat> was to make a record that sounded like if you combined Kraftwerk and Rick James, what would that sound like? Oh, yeah. So I go to this studio, the music building on 38th Street. It's still there. Madonna was there, everybody. All the young bands used to rehearse there. You could share rehearsal rooms. So there was a lot of co-mingling and bands meeting each other. So I go to his rehearsal loft. And at the time, the Oberheim synthesizer, the DMX, the DSX had just come out. And he had he had the system. He had yeah. that, that rig. So I had no idea what to expect. I thought maybe it might be something on the order of like a Steely Dan kind of vibe or something kind of similarly muso. But he pushed the button on the OBX, you know, song he had been programming for weeks. And the track was the track to In Times of Passion. Wow. And it blew my freaking mind because it was exactly what I thought that I would like to take my music to. Um, I had never actually, I hadn't written anything in that genre. <laughs> But so when knew. he said, he said, oh, great, great. You have any ideas? And I just sang what came to my mind first. And he said, great, finish writing it. And we're going to go to the studio tomorrow and record it, recording it. <laughs> I was like, mm, finish writing it tonight and go to the <laughs> studio and record it tomorrow. Okay. Sure enough, though, I went home and it just, it just kind of all came to me, all the pieces Every part of it came to me in one evening. And David picked me up like seven, eight o'clock in the morning in his Volkswagen Squareback. <laughs> and we went out to this recording studio in Long Island and we recorded everything all in one day, the track, the vocal, overdub, we mixed it. Um, and so the next morning we get, I'm getting home like, I don't know, it's like six in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I live in, I have the basement of my mother's house, so I had, all our gear we used to rehearse down there I had a huge sound system and macintosh amps i mean it was it was a killer system and so i put this cassette on and i'm like this is it like this is mm -hmm. this is my time to use every opportunity that i have and use my connections and so i did the next morning it was still it was actually morning nine o'clock 
I went into the city. I called Dennis King, who, as I said, was my mentor and a mastering engineer at Atlantic Records. And I said, hey, could you cut me a couple lacquers of this? And he cut me three lacquers in Times of Passion. We didn't even have a name for the band. I think the label says my name or something. So cut these lacquers. I knew two or three people in record companies that could put us on. Um, one was um, Ray Caviano, who that he, he had the label that Change was on in New York, and Jim mm -hmm. Delahant, who had been on the road with Clear, and we had met there, and he said, hey, anytime, you know, if you have, ever have anything, bring it to me, I'd love to hear it. So I took the lacquer first to um, Ray Caviano, and I played it for him, and he said, wow, this is great. I'd love to sign the album. This is amazing. I, I want, he had his label, had Gino Socio. It had Shane. It was like a really modern kind of cutting edge. It was like the edge of R&B and Euro kind of funk, right. but it was really yeah. all the records. Every record he put out was cool. Yeah. I said, well, I have to go play it for one other person. And that person was Jim Delahan. So I walked to Atlantic um, offices, which was on, I don't know, 49th Street, 50th Street. And I called Jim. He said, oh, sure, come on up, come on up. Mm. So I go up, take the lacquer. He puts it on the turntable, drops the needle, listens to like 20 seconds of it tops. He said, hold on a second, hold on a second, I'll be right back. And so he comes back through, that, through the door with Jerry Greenberg. Now, Jerry Greenberg was kind of my idol. I mean, he was, he's the guy who signed Led Zeppelin and signed, you know, yeah. All he was responsible for really the new edge, the new side, the new site of Atlantic. You know, he was he was a man. So he walked in, said hi, very kind of sheepishly. He sat in a chair with his back to me because the speakers were on the opposite wall. And Jim put the record on. It played like a minute and a half. And he turned around in this chair with this big wide grin and said, you got yourself a record deal. So this all happened in one 24 hour period. Like, wow. literally. yes. Wow. So, so I go downstairs and this is true to my partner in form. I love him, but this is true to his form. I go downstairs to the phone booth on the corner, pay phone. We didn't have cell phones then. Right. And I call him and I said, David. And before I could say anything, he said, you know, I'm not so sure about the B section of the song. <laughs> I said, David, we have a record deal. He's like, what, what, what? And we had, we had a record deal at that moment. Let's take a listen. For those who don't remember, let's take a listen to a little piece. I'll fast forward to for a second. Yep, yep, that Man. funk, Man. that funk, that new funk. There it yeah. is. So, so oh, there we man. were, and so then we became the system. And, we needed that in our lives. Man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We yes. absolutely. And then, of course, uh, this album happened. Obviously, we saw a little bit clip of it on on the. Uh, but yeah, I mean, sweat happened, and it features the song "You Are in My System," which everybody knows here. I don't yeah. think I have to play a clip of that because mm -hmm. you guys already have it playing in your head. You're already singing it. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I want to I want to ask you this because um, not many folks know this. Well, actually, before we get here, tell me about the first time that you heard that song on the radio, whether it's, oh, it's yeah. happened or and and you know where you were, or maybe <laughs> even. When it, oh, maybe this is hilarious! It was really obvious that you had a, a huge hit on your hand and this was going to be bigger than yeah. the and you're talking about in times of passion uh, yeah i mean w wherever you realize yeah yeah this, so that's okay, the line so so i'm on the road with clear you know road 
roadie, glorified road manager. I mean, when the shit got to get done, I'm making it happen. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm carrying this Ampeg SVT. I don't know if you know that bass amp. It's like the biggest bass amp ever known to men. Even the head, the head had eight KT88 tubes. The thing with the head weighed like 100 pounds and the cabinet weighed 200 pounds. So I'm carrying one end of an SVT. Now, David's on the bus because he was playing keyboards with clear. And as I approach the bus, he says, Mick, they're playing a song on the radio. They're playing it. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I could hear in times of passion. Uh, it's crazy, right? Well, I mean, it's, and and I, I forgot to mention, I'm moving the equipment because it started pouring down rain. It was like torrential. It was, it, I was walking in mud. It was crazy. It was crazy out. And um, from that moment on, you know, it, um, I guess my history was written, you know. Yeah, right. And I said I wasn't going to do it, but I'm I'm going to do it. Anyways, I'm going to play a little clip of it from your thing. All right, all right. We, it, it, that it, chorus, it, man, it, that it, chorus. I'll tell you it, a funny story. David was like, that's the verse. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> and the, that other thing is the verse. Mm. And I remember, I remember coming back because he had the track. You're in my system. And we had done a bunch of gigs in Florida, track dates, a lot of them. We went down there for like two days and did six gigs, like all around the clock, like mm. uh, midnight, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. We're talking back in the wild days of, of Miami. <clears throat> so we're coming back and I listened to the track and I said to him on the plane, I'm like, I have, I have, the, I have the title. I got it. I don't have the whole thing, but I got the title because I had seen Gone with the Wind on TV in the hotel room. And there's a scene where I forget the black actress, actress, she was a famous black actress, Hetty McDaniels says to whatever her name is, the the um, the, the queen, um, he, he's in your system. You just can't get him out of your system. He's in your system. She says that in the movie. If you ever watched it again, you'll see it. And I was like, What's the title wow. of this movie again? Gone, Gone with, with the wind. wind. Oh, Gone with the Wind. I was like, I Hedda McDaniels. Hedda McDaniels is a bedroom scene, and she's telling wow. Vivian Lee, is that her name? I can't think of her name. He, yeah. He's the man, the man is in your system. He's just in your system. You can't get him on your system. So we get on the plane and we're coming back to New York. And I said, Hey, Dave, once again, classic David. I love him, but. <laughs> I said, David, I got I got a title for the song. You're in my system. And he looked at me like I had two heads. And I was like, no, 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 you, you, you'll see, you'll see. Because I already had that emotion and that I was going gonna, was gonna to be emotive. It wasn't going to be like an electro. It was going to be a heartfelt, real thing. And I think I went home, we wrote it, we recorded it like in the next couple of days. And mm. then that came out and it was like, it was all over. It was on every station. You could sit in your car and flip between WBLS and Hot 97, whatever the stations were, and it would just be it would be on all the stations at the same time. It was a, it was a, it was an amazing moment. Well, and and I want to tell you this because this is going to be a little bit of a we're gonna, we're going to take a little bit of a minute break here because I want to play something for you. Um, not many folks know this, but. You Are In My System was a song that Prince mm. used to occasionally jam on during their sound checks. Wow. <laughs> Fan. Were you aware of that? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I kind of heard it a little bit okay. somewhere. Well, yeah, so I'm going to play a little clip of that right now. It's going to be a little minute clip, but he I don't think he even knew the words. It was just kind of, but you knew what he was doing, and uh, he never got to the chorus. I think he did you or the chorus, but... Uh, yeah, you can find this, but let's take a listen just for a second because it's it's definitely interesting. Baby, I 
Those minor 11s come in there. He wasn't ready for that. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. To hear, it's really interesting to hear him just kind of do this little jams on this stuff. And and uh, obviously he was a huge fan. Yeah, and- I, I mean, I have a great Prince story. Um, I don't know what year this was, but um, I think the Pleasure Seekers was out. I think that was the song. So there was a show. It was called um, Top 100, whatever it was called. So the the idea was they'd have three bands play. Um, that night it was Cool and the Gang, Celebrate what Celebration was out, and mm-hmm. Prince, Little Red Corvette, and we did. I think it was the Pleasure Seekers, but I'm not positive. So I'm standing in the wings. Um, I had seen Prince years before on the Rick James tour, but obviously like a number of years had passed. And I had had many conversations with the gentleman, John McClain on A&M, who was a huge Prince fan. Um, you know, we'd have these talks because, you know, Prince was coming up and I really, I love what he was doing. I love, you know, I love what he was doing. So we do this show. So Cool and the Gang plays Celebration. Um, so, oh, the, the gist of it is, whichever song moves up the charts, by the time they do the next episode, they would air that perform those two performances. So two out of three mm. would get aired, and one would get cut. I wish I wish I could find a, a copy of that. <clears throat> so Cool and the Gang goes on. Obviously, celebrate. It goes to number one for a hundred weeks, and Prince comes out and does Little Red Corvette. No, I hadn't seen how advanced he had gotten. <laughs> <laughs> with the performing and the yeah. the mic acrobatics and the splits i mean he had just he had just taken it to a whole other level so i'm standing in the wings watching and i'm i'm listening to a little red corvette and i was like in my mind i was like you're not going on next week kid <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> little little red corvette sure enough went up to like number 3 and we kind of stayed where we were but it was a very he, it was a great performance. I don't know. I don't know if that show aired, but I'm sure it did somewhere. I'd love. I'd love for you to see that. Mm. Yeah, those types of shows they typically make them lip sync, and Prince hated lip syncing. Matter of fact, I think the Dick Clark show was probably one of the few shows that he ever lip synced because they were just forced to because they weren't. I guess you would. They, they obviously had the technology to be able to mic everything but for whatever Not reason so much but it's the mix it's the mm. do they have the ability to get your mix to sound right right, right. You yeah know, when you have your sound guy they're not mm. let that those unions are not letting your sound guy mix That's on it. air so right. there's more of a chance there's more of a risk that they're going to make you sound jacked up like having the vocal way too loud and, and the music too soft it's a better chance to just do the lip sync and then, you know, you do your live show and let it speak for itself. You know, I, I mean, I understand the argument, but it's so difficult for, for companies, to, you know, shows to get that part together. Hmm. Yeah. So, and this actually segues into my next question. DJ Danny G says, what does Mick think of Robert Palmer version? He said, that was my introduction to the system. I got the Robert Palmer 12 inch and then I went and bought the system album. So my question that I actually had next was, we know that Robert Palmer also covered you are in my system. Did Robert ask your permission or was one of those things that just happened and you found out later? What I mean, no, uh, we had, we got word that he was in um, a club in Paris and he heard the record and he wanted to cover it. So for, for me at the time with my knowledge of publishing and, you know, my love for Robert Palmer, I mean, Jack says we used to play a couple of Robert Palmer songs in our set. So I was a huge, huge, huge fan of Robert Palmer, huge. So I was like completely 
honored and I didn't see it as anything detrimental to, in fact, I thought it would help spread our musicianship and our songwriting out to the masses in a, in a bigger way. So I was a hundred percent for it. Yeah. I think that that typically happens. I mean, you know, we always, we've talked about this story before with Dolly Parton um, when Whitney Houston covered, I will always love you. But the difference <laughs> there was, was that Dolly had no idea that Whitney Houston was, was covering her song and she was driving down the road. And all of a sudden Whitney Houston's version of the song came over the radio and Dolly said she almost wrecked her car because she was just like, "That's my did song." She, it was what's happening she, here. Liked it? Or she, did she not like? It? No, she loved it. She oh loved yeah, well, it. fantastic. I mean, but Clive Davis, Clive Davis does what he wants. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Right. I mean, she's a songwriter, right? Dolly uh, Parton wrote that oh, song, yeah. so right. they have to. Yeah, they have to get permission. They always send your publisher, you know, hey, we're covering this song. Here's a copy of it. Even even then. So maybe her management, you know, maybe it didn't get to her. Dolly's, she's a huge, she doesn't read every email or read every letter, I'm sure. She's huge. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a blessing. Yeah, so, yeah, and the system went on to release five albums, obviously. Mm -hmm. I think it was like a total of five albums, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And including your next big hit, which was Don't Disturb Don't This Disturb Groove. This groove. Yes. That mm -hmm. was ah. a banger. Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> you know, was a monster. <laughs> You know, the thing about the system is very, very Hall & Oates like in that every single album, every song is really well done and really well crafted. And there's a lot of time that's spent on everything. And the most that most typically that people hear are just whatever you're given by the radio gods. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and uh, that is, um, you know, I, I, I think that may have been a little bit of a disservice to you between you are in my system and don't disturb this groove, you know, which are there like songs or even albums specifically in between those two oh. that you were just like, God dang, why didn't no, that, no. Hit? What, what, what are some of the ones that you. Hands hit? down, hands down experiment. Mm. Experiment has lollipops and everything promises can break experiment the song it's the best it's the best system album but i know what happened then because the record label mirage was folding into atlantic and we didn't have a champion there so that record just kind of sat but that record had i hope mm. you listen to it one time top to bottom it had four or five singles we crushed it we crushed it um but it just didn't it didn't get released it didn't get pushed correctly um and it just fell by the wayside. But experiment X and then P E R I M E N T, amazing yeah. record mixed by Michael Brower, who is one of my favorite engineers. Um, and this was in the day. This was before you had a lot of um, plugins. Everything was leave console and live mixing. Such so performance. You know, it's like echoes it's like hitting echo sins it's like hmm. flooding reverbs on the vocal it's like hey dave you take those faders down there make you take it was performance if you listen to that album to me that's the that's the best work we ever did there's uh nine songs on that one right yes yes yeah yes. Yes. bad girl i want to milk yep okay. yep yes. lollipops and everything for sure yeah man just uh <sighs> so I, I got a question for you um can Considering how uh, you were, the the timing and uh, the blessings, you know, meeting the right people and socializing in your personality, so you get you get the business experience with the publishing and learning all that stuff, and then of course road managing for Clear and just getting all that back end stuff that a lot of artists do not get to learn. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. because of that, what kind of lessons? came out of that that helped your band like when you guys were on the road be it it could be good or bad or the proverbial you know kick yourself for doing something you knew better because you you pick up things that others don't think of so um you know by the time the system started flourishing mm -hmm. i think we produced too many other outside artists so <clears throat> we had a little bit of a difference of opinion about that um which would become our livelihood would the live shows become my livelihood or making records for other people. I grew up going back to Jamaica, Queens, like 
you don't play on anybody else's shit. <laughs> right. It's our band, our right. sound. You don't spread it around. You you know, this is us. We keep it tight. We don't do. It's a little bit like Prince's theory when mm -hmm. he got mad at Jim and Lewis for producing outside records. But <clears throat> on the other hand, <clears throat> it makes a little bit more longevity to your career and that you have a lot of songs spread out. It's like risk assessment, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you know, you're spreading out a lot more songs in a lot of different places. And perhaps that will make your song, your publishing, everything worth more. But sometimes it kind of can diffuse the magic that you have because no one else can do what you're doing, you know? So mm. it's a little, it's a little bit of a toss up in my mind. Um, I think at some point, after Don't Disturb This Groove, we were flooded with so many productions in Europe and, you know, the UK and Japan. And, you know, we were producing a lot. We opened our own studio, which is a whole other job in itself. You know, it's a whole yeah. other headspace uh, that pulls away, pulls you away from, you know, the creative aspect of just writing great songs. So, you know, I think in retrospect, that's one of the things I learned. So if I come back, as a musician again, instead of like a, a a cat or a giraffe, I will do that a little bit differently. I'll manage that a little bit differently. Mm, okay. We got a couple shout outs here. Uh, this is, it says, what's up, Mick? Donald Fleming. Soul oh, <laughs> so that's, that's my original first band, Donald Fleming, Ronald Fleming, Robert Fontaine, and Wait Ronnie Drayton. Oh, Ronnie Drayton. Drayton is? What year is this? Oh, the Soul Shakers, like 70, God, I must have, I was like 16 or 17, 70s, 70, early 70s. So 70s. have you talked to Donald Fleming How since when? Yeah, last I mean, we're kind of in touch. Ronald Fleming and Donald Fleming, we're in touch. Like we touch base, you know, on Facebook or, or whatever. Yeah, we grew up, man, that was, that was my first band, my first like um, managing how to make a band better. And we're going to rehearse more. And we're going to learn this song. We're going to, that intro is not right. And that, you know, so, so I love those guys, man. I love those guys. Um, Tara Powell asked, how did working with Shaka Khan come about? Ooh, 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 ooh. That's a great one. So we're recording, um, don't disturb this groove at Atlantic studios. They had a studio in Columbus circle. They had three rooms. <clears throat> And Arif Martin, Arif Mardin, some say Arif Martin, who I had kind of, I had kind of grown up around because uh, Dennis King and Jimmy Douglas, they kind of was kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of a mascot in the studio. You know, I could just kind of hang out and sit behind the sofa when they were recording, and the singer couldn't see me. And you know, a lot of sessions, a lot of great sessions. Um, so we end up at this point recording at Atlantic Studios. Don't disturb this group with Jimmy Douglas. Jimmy Douglas is our recording engineer. So we're in Studio 2, which had an MCI console, and Arif Mardin is producing Shaka in Studio A. So he must have mentioned to David at some point, hey, do you have something for Shaka? And David said, yeah, let's see what we can come up with. So we had this track, um, This Is My Night, and I took it home and in one night I wrote my female persona. <laughs> I did it to a T and the next day we brought it into him and he, and he loved it. It was really going to be the first single before, um, what was our end? Uh, I feel for you. It was supposed to be the first single, but it ended up, I feel for you was the first single. Um, this is my night. It was, wow. That's how that came wow. about. That's, that's fantastic. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, are you still are you, are you still out, out and about? Because Tanya says, where can I see Mick live? <laughs> um, you know, look, we're working on a new system album. We really what? are. I know it's been it's been uh, like two years, uh, but we uh, do. Uh, 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 really? Did, uh, yeah, yeah. It's been like it's been like two years. Did we just COVID, get a? Wait, wait, was uh, it, is this an exclusive that's happening? Exclusive? Do we just no, get I mean, I mean, people know. People, we've been talking about uh, it a little bit. We I have, didn't know. <laughs> anybody, anybody here know? Yeah, it's, we, we have the title, Time Stretching. We have okay. like eight or nine songs so far. We've mixed 
with Jimmy Douglas and Chris Lord Algae in Los Angeles. And I think we need like just two more songs because we got to come barrels loaded. So we're right. close. And don't forget we had COVID. So we were like sending tracks back and forth. David lives in LA. I live in New York. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in the past, we were always a little bit in the same room. So we're getting there. Um, but we definitely have a new system album and it's got to bang and it's got to be us. It's got to sound like us, but it's got to be now at the same time. So it's, you know, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. And, all right. Okay. Wow. Didn't uh, see that coming. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely positively did not see that coming. Love it. Um, so here's one of the things I want to talk about. And one, one of the reasons why you, we're back on the radar here was obviously for the mighty soulmates. Mm. So for mm. those that don't know, the mighty soulmates is a group that I guess look at Paul's hair. Uh, <laughs> that's so, my man right there, man. Yeah, that's yeah. St. Paul Peter. So we, this is a super group of St. Paul Peterson, Andre Simone, Nick Murphy, and Gardner Cole. And for those who don't know who Gardner Cole is, uh, he's got some work with, you know, Empath. He also does a lot of songwriting. He's done songwriting with Cher, Michael McDonald, Tina Turner, uh, Jody Watley. I talked about this earlier, Madonna, open your heart. You know, so yep. it, he, he's that uh, this is a super group right here. This is like, I mean, you've got four talented songwriters all in this mix and a lot of yeah. people have not heard about um have not heard about this this project this was something yeah, that yeah. and now we have we have volume one and now volume two out and then we remastered volume one and volume two the mastering just incredible so gardner is the mastermind behind all of this mm -hmm. i mean we, we we all know each other we've had various um, moments when we wrote songs together or wrote songs for different artists, you know, individually. But one day I get this call from Gardner and he's like, what are you doing? It's funny. This is another thing I want to talk about, you know, about music and careers and everything. We were kind of all at the same place at the same time. Our record deals were ending. Mm -hmm. Marriages were ending. Relationships were ending. We're trying to find out what, which way to go. Should we sign with a new label? Should we do demo? Each of us individually, all at the same time in different corners of, of you know, North America. Um, mm -hmm. So I get this call from Gardner, and he says, "Hey, I, you know, I've been I've been kind of writing with Paul Peterson and Andre, and we're thinking, you know, asking if you want to come out and." and sing on some of the stuff. I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> it was a perfect timing. I had no relationship tying me down. I had, it was, I had no reason that I had to be in New York. So I broke out and Gardner, if you know Gardner, he's very, um, very earth bound, um, vegetarian, vitamins, um, Limbo. eating yeah. right, drinking mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. health conscious. So it was like, it was like a musical summer camp. Now I didn't know. Well, I had I had actually did a demo or two with St. Paul for his solo album in New York. So I had worked with him and Andre. I knew, but we had never really, really hung. But we really, we just we clicked. We just clicked. Something about Andre and I just clicked from the beginning. So when he said to me, "Why don't you come out?" So you're gonna come. I was like, "Let's go." So we go to LA and we're all staying at Gardner's house. So Gardner has a studio in his garage. Um, he has like a pool in the back. He has all these animals running around, four or five bedrooms, enough bedroom for us to all sleep. And we stayed for about a month, hmm. a little more. We made maybe a couple trips, a few times, and you know, I had to go to New York and touch base or whatever. But in that time, we wrote 25 songs. 25 songs and and the beauty of it there was no ego we just kind of you know someone's sitting on the sofa playing oh, what's that you're playing oh that's cool i got something for that and we would just go in and, re and cut it and we would you know this went on we wrote 25 songs in like two months which is 
<laughs> that ain't easy, baby. Yeah. <laughs> that especially, I mean, we have some changes and harmonies. And and the other thing, when we got on the mic to sing the harmonies, it sounded like we had been singing together forever since birth. The harmonies just just naturally, just completely naturally. And um, I gotta tell you, it was one of the best summers of my life. It really was. So, and just real quick, if you guys are interested in purchasing this album or taking take a listen to some of the clips, you can go to funkatopia.com slash Mick. That's F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A.com slash Mick, M-I-C. And uh, we've got links there that you can kind of, where you can pick up the albums on uh, on Amazon. I typically, we like to push it to Spotify so you can hear the tracks, but the reality of it is, is that Buy they don't the records be on Spotify, so we don't do that. Right. Uh, if you want to check it out, you can check it out, but where you will be directed to um, where you can check out the clips there on Amazon Music and also pick it up because yes, please check it out, man. This really is great. Crazy. It's great music. It's great, you know, to see. It's great to hear us cats doing what we do in a band format because I'm mm-hmm. we all everybody in the Soulmates really came from playing in a band like at the root of it all, like playing in a live band. And you mm-hmm. can hear in this record, there's a lot of live band playing and straight takes, performances, and just just a groove, man. 24 songs, 25, 24 songs in these two albums. And then I recently found, I unearthed one more song that was on that was on DAT. <laughs> um, so they're 25 songs. Wow. So what what happened with this? Why, why? I mean, this was recorded in 1993 and didn't see the light of day until 2021, volume one. And then, as you said, volume two uh, just came out not just a couple months ago in June of 2023. So what 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 happened? Well, OK, so actually, the the Northridge earthquake happened. So uh-huh. we were we were out there, I think, in December at some point to kind of touch up mixes and the earthquake hit. I don't remember exactly what the date was, but it destroyed Gardner's house, like oh. literally destroyed his house. And, you know, we all kind of had to return to the home base. And we were, at that time, we were kind of working with a and Records. And then we had a couple offers, but, you know, we, you know, it's like when you lose a month or two, and that's another lesson I learned is that, you can't sit on you can't sit on eggs forever. You just you make them and you let them hatch. You can't just like be an egg sitter. You got this dope material. And the other thing is a lot mm. insecurity. You know, I mean, it's sometimes it's like you're trying to compete with what you think you hear, and you don't want to take the chance to tarnish you know your reputation, even when it's great. It's like, is there something better? You know what I'm saying? So that mm. when you don't go straight from the frying pan to the kitchen and serve it and you think overthink it, that's what happens. But um recently, like it what two years ago now, or I say recently, two years, um, I had been listening to the DATs. I you know, everything was on a DAT, and you know how DAT players are. They don't <laughs> they don't work. No. Half the time, none of them work. You can't even find somebody with one that works. That's right. <laughs> so I had a DAT player and I put one tape in and it kind of chewed up the beginning. And I was like, mm. fuck. But I had a few things on cassette. So I went to this place and had all the DATs transferred to CD mm. so I could really listen to them. And I listened to them and I reached out to the guys. I'm like, guy, we're sitting, we're sitting on some beautiful eggs here. You got to listen. You got to listen to everything. So I sent it to them and everybody got really excited and everybody was like, yeah, this is cool. And I happened to be working with uh, a longtime friend, uh, Tony Prendot, who runs um, a label. He has a distribution deal through Columbia. And I sent it to him and he he just flipped over it and he played it for Columbia and they loved it. So they said, hey, we'll handle distribution because, you know, distribution, it's a difficult thing. I mean, it's 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 for distributors. It's for, I'm not discouraging anybody from releasing their own material, but if you're going to still create and write music and do all that stuff that it takes to keep moving the musical thing forward, it takes a lot of time that um, someone else already has a setup to push a button and it goes to all the, you know, it's distributed everywhere. 
everything gets collected and taken care of for you and you can go about making music. So that's how we got the new release of volume one and now volume two. Now, one of the things I noticed on volume one, I, I do see a couple of questions here that are asking about you and Dave writing for Howard Johnson. We're going to, we're going to go back to that, but I do while we're in the, the mighty soulmates mix here. Um, the closing song on volume one is a cover of ball and ball of confusion. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I was looking at some of the credits in on discogs and it lists Barrett strong and Norman Whitfield who, as the writers who, as writers. And um, who were those on no produced hits for Barry Gordon's Motown. Like uh, I heard it through the grapevine. Uh, Papa was a Rolling Stone. And of course, ball of confusion and war were, were they, uh, I, I guess, are, are they, one of them still with us, right? Yeah, um, I think Barrett Strong passed away. Hmm. I can't, I can't remember for sure, but they were always my favorite songwriters of the Motown era. Because, like I said, coming up, it was more funk rock, and all their songs had the wah wah and distortion, and it was like reverbs and crazy little. You know, um, even on a Diana Ross song, I can't, um, Reflection, no, was it Reflections? There was one song where they used that repeat, delay, and reverb. They were always my favorite writers, hands down. Mm. So um, we were kind of talking about, hey, what song, what song should we cover? Let's cover one song. And the theme of it, you know, the fact that we could all, you know, sing different parts. Um, we could play it live and, and you know, record it live. Um, really played into that so um you know we decided to cover that song hmm. I, I love the fact that got some funkatopians here that have that have already already purchased the album we got uh christina oh, says, place my order and uh brian davis thank says, you thank you amazon sold love it thank you <laughs> yeah that's, that's awesome man thank uh, you guys man <laughs> you're really you're you're spreading music out in ways um that are incredible i really appreciate what you're doing brothers <laughs> yeah so I also recall, you know, since we're talking about some of these hit and pieces, uh, well, let's really quickly, let's, let, let's finish up with, uh, with mighty soulmates here. Cause you've got volume two now. So volume two just came out in June of 2023. You can still get to it from that funkatopia.com slash Mick. Um, these are the other songs that were not on volume one, correct? There wasn't any additional songs that were added in later or touches or. Nope. Nope. But I got to tell you that. I curated the volume one, volume two. So when making volume one, I made sure that volume one wasn't all the joints and volume two <laughs> was duds. No, I made sure it was a hard, it was hard holding those horses back. But right. We right. had enough dynamite in there, you know, with various leads, Andre singing lead, St. Paul singing lead, Gardner singing lead me singing lead and then splitting the vocals on some song. We had enough juice on all the songs. Both volumes are a dope. I don't, I don't know which I, which one I prefer to be honest with you. Um, mm. We have one song on volume one because we haven't, we haven't really, really released a second single from volume one. I want to be the one that St. Paul Peterson sang that it was like, there's, there's a couple charts here and then, the UK, where that song was number one for like 12, 13, 14 weeks. It was getting ridiculous. I would I would send St. Paul like a, a text and say, number one again, brother. <laughs> I mean, it's really, he's kicking ass. He's killing on that song. <laughs> that's um, yes. that, that's both a album, both song. Album, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Both volumes are, are, are solid. Yeah, that opening track uh, for on volume two uh the song uh heavenly body i think is what it's oh, called yeah heavenly mm -hmm. body man that that let me see let me hold on a second let me see if i can just play a little taste because i know people want to get a little taste of this thing let me see if i can share this if, yes if it's yes not, yes yes it's not gonna kill me or not let's just see because and the other thing too is facebook if you guys happen to be kicked off of uh for us playing music because facebook is ridiculous like that just head over to youtube.com slash funkatopia we'll, we'll fix it later in post but for right now we, we need to enjoy and get a little taste of some of this stuff let's let's take a listen to this Woo! 
cosa. It gets funky. You know it yes. does. You know, it does. A, you know, there's a cup, there's a cut in here that's very much a Brothers Johnson, an ode to kind of Brothers Johnson. It's not, it's not a cover or anything, but just the feel of it when I hear it, it just reminds me of that Brothers Johnson energy, man. And um, mm. man, it's 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 a different record, only in that it's dedicated the sound of it is to live bands and very little programming and you know it's like it's like really mostly live playing which is um which is just cool just yeah that's cool. cool it's just fantastic it's just unreal all right so let's go ahead let's go ahead and talk about just a just a couple little things that people have been asking so so we can kind of get that out of the way uh saint paul's blue cadillac song that uh you played that actually featured you and andre which was done 25 years ago in wow. 1996 do you remember um do you remember recording that and what you know nope. <laughs> <laughs> i don't <laughs> i couldn't you know what um saint paul came to new york and we cut a couple songs at science lab I couldn't remember the names of the songs. I couldn't remember anything. I just knew they were good. And one day I was digging through and I found, I found them. No, actually St. Paul found one and I found the other. You know, when at that level and that time we were writing so much and, and you know, no, I do not remember. Let's see if, I, <laughs> see if, we, could, if we could pull it up and see if it's yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, yes. J just so we can kind of take a listen and see, see if it, it sparks any memories because mm -hmm. I remember Paul sending this to me and going, Hey, check this out. And uh, I was like, yeah, this is really, really great. And then nothing really came of it for whatever reason, but uh, it's, you know, this is a little taste of blue Cadillac. Oh, that's all something more. Come on, baby, and climb aboard. It's your fantasy. Be just what you want to be, girl. All right. Let your head down. Ain't nobody else around. Your finest. God, let's take a ride, my baby. Blue Cadillac. Okay. So that's a little taste of that yeah yeah, so yeah 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 i think i sang in the chorus or something yeah yep yep and i guess the last one we'll talk about here is uh zlhtp said can make discuss him and dave writing for howard johnson's doing it my way and attitude oh. Pump the nation both of them <laughs> yeah okay let me start with attitude pump the nation so i took a cue from prince um when Prince um, spread out and produced his friend's band. Yeah. And uh, and so I was like, you know, if Prince can do it, we should make another group called Attitude. And I have I had a few guys. One uh, keyboard player extraordinaire, musical genius, Chris Kello, keyboard player, who grew up in my neighborhood. He was like one of the prodigies, musical prodigies at the time. Uh, I asked him if he'd be interested in doing it. And also Cindy Mizell. I don't know if you know who she is. She's She sings with everybody. She's, I think she's on tour with Steely Dan. And, you know, she's, it's just, it was, she's just an incredible singer. And I met her actually when I was, I'm going back before, before I was a sound man on the road with the Sugar Hill Gang and Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. <laughs> and the wow. sequence. Oh my God. And the sequence. I'm talking like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. A guy named Ron Hill. I, I want to shout him out, even though he may not see this now, he might see it later. Ron Hill was their road manager. 
and he knew me from the city of my bands and he knew I not only did I play in the band, I also did the sound from the side of the stage, right? So I knew mm. I knew my sound shit. And I was also doing live sound on the road for Clear when they were touring with, um, when they were doing all their tours, I would do their live sound. So he asked me one time, he's like, hey, yeah, um, Sugar Hill Gang and Grandmaster Flash, they were hitting hard. Like they had, they had some heavy records out at the time. They were killing it on the road. So he asked me if I would be interested in going on the road. And I was like, yeah. So at, at the beginning of the tour, the Sugar Hill Gang, they were the headliners because they had um, whatever that their theme was. The uh, message? The, the, no, it wasn't the message. Sugar oh, Hill Gang oh. was, um, Hip -hop. Was, the chic, was the chic groove. Um, I forget the name of it. And Grandmaster Flash had the message, but that was the a message. slow riser. So we got on tour. Sugar Hill Gang had a legit tour bus you know, like with beds and like legit. And Grandmaster Flash had a school bus, a yellow school bus. <laughs> <laughs> and we would sleep on there. And, you know, you imagine how uncomfortable it was riding yeah. in a yellow school bus. Rapper's Delight. Rapper's Delight. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And it came to me and the sermon popped up too. <laughs> yeah, they were highly competitive with each other. So... The Sugar Hill Gang would pay me, tip me fifty dollars to make sure they sounded louder than Grandmaster Flash, and Grandmaster Flash would tip me fifty dollars to make sure they were louder than Sugar Hill Gang. <laughs> real talk, real talk. So, so they're from they're from Jersey. I'm like, you know, I'm from I'm from Queens. I'm a little bit continental. I'm not, you know, street. I'm not hoodly. So I'm coming back off the road with all this cash in my pocket, right? Seriously, seriously, like a bundle for that time. And I'm like, I'm thinking, man, maybe this is a setup. Maybe they both tip me because when I get back, they're gonna, <laughs> someone's going to come and rob me. <laughs> <laughs> so I got Ron Hill. I'm like, yo, Ron, I got, I'm carrying a bundle here. Can you, can you drop me off on the other side of the bridge? <laughs> 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 this is true this is real stuff real real stuff <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> so uh what did i say that i said that what, was that what were we talking about i'm sorry i got a little lost in, in the <laughs> no, reality we, of that story in the movie howard johnson we were talking about howard johnson oh yeah howard johnson oh we were talking about well i was talking about um attitude attitude first and then so there was attitude and we made um this album pump the nation with mm. chris Mm -hmm. um, and another friend of mine, Stefan Miller and Cindy. And it ended up having like a huge hit in New York because Frankie Crocker, who was a DJ on WBLS, he used to always say, actually kind of bit the, his theme, he used to always say, um, WBLS, we got the juice. So <laughs> I wrote the song with that kind of, mental and that hook and it ended up being a huge hit in new york i don't know if it spread to other parts of the country but it was a it was a huge hit well, um, I'm so, so, okay, no. so then I'm, howard johnson i'm sorry, I'm sorry. There's, a prince, there's a prince song called the juice that we got the juice turn it up it's i don't think it's oh. a, i don't think it's a release mm, no, it's, it's, <laughs> i don't think it's released i don't know <laughs> i don't know <laughs> who knows i don't know we had a lot of Connection, Jam and Lewis, the system. Oh, yeah, yeah. We all we had a little bit of a mm -hmm. cross pollination going on, like where I'm I'm listening to them, they're listening to us, and it just kind of it kind of melded into into a place where some things have similarity, um, yeah. but both are both highly original. But there were similarities in the flow, you know, particularly on the radio at the time because we were both using. Uh, drum machines kind of as the core, the basis mm -hmm. for the track through writing. So, you know, it's it's all love and it's all like, you know, all spray and love and war, baby. Uh, man, it has been an absolute honor having you really? on the show today to kind of share really? all your stories. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Mick Murphy of the system of yes. the SAS group <laughs> of the mighty soulmates, the road management for clear. I mean, this is walking music history legend right here. Mick Murphy, <laughs> thank you so, so much for taking you, time bro. out of your day to come on the show, man. I appreciate man, it. Man, Funkatopia, I totally enjoyed it. I want to thank you both for having me. Um, man, thoroughly enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyable. You well, guys have a great evening and um, keep doing what you're doing, man, because it's beautiful. Yeah, Absolutely. I and I have, a, I, have a, I have a request for you. I have a request. When the system, when you guys get it together and uh, get that new album out and we're all promoting it and pushing it for you, mm -hmm. make a stop in Atlanta when you do your tour dates. 100%. Yeah, please. 100%. That's it. You can't wait to see it. <laughs> all right, guys. A couple yeah. things. No, look for a new system album that they're putting together. It's not right here on the immediate horizon, but keep an eye out. There's one that's in the work. But for yep. right now, The Mighty Soulmates, Volume 2, Supergroup with Mick Murphy, St. Paul Peterson, Andre Simone, and Gardner Cole is available right now. Just came out in June of 2023. It's available right now. And if you don't even know what happened to Volume 1, that's out there too. Just go to funkatopia.com slash Mick. F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A dot com slash Mick and go and purchase through there so they will actually get a they they deserve it. This is an amazing you, with some amazing tracks and we can't wait. All right. Thank you so much, man. Mr. Christopher and Jeff, really appreciate man your time. Oh, thank you guys so so thank you so much for, for coming and I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right, God bless. God bless. <laughs> okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was the amazing Mick Man. Murphy, dude. Come on, awesomeness. Come on. All right, uh, yeah. man. This it's it's always good. It's always good. And of course, if you missed any of this, if you missed any of this broadcast, we will um um we'll pick <laughs> with your know. nose at we'll some point. <laughs> so if you missed any of the show, we'll put it up on Spotify. And uh, iHeartRadio and Odyssey, wherever you listen to your your app, your your podcast, and uh, please make sure that if you're listening, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, just do all those little bells and whistles and all that stuff, please. Uh, absolutely. All right, let's uh, get into the news scenario. As you can see hmm. behind me, right here behind us, you've got the. Well, it says Prince Highway, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, but it's the Prince Rogers Nelson Memorial Highway. And I happened to see that Mark Webster was uh, in the mix here. I, I just saw him in the yeah, chat room. In. Yeah, I saw him pop in uh, and he was checking out the show. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit about this because uh, for those that didn't know, um, yesterday they did the Prince Rogers Nelson Memorial Highway inauguration <laughs> that gets a fern <laughs> yeah that definitely does it's it's uh absolutely positive and and, and we've got to get a a little bit of uh oh no i turned it on the ground that's right <laughs> we got to get that in there uh and if you're really excited about it we'll also give you a <laughs> wow okay <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll give you one. Get some new ones. Me, 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 me. I'll get some. <laughs> if you're really, really excited. <laughs> I like uh, that. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. so anyways, it was very cool because it was supposed to be an unveiling. And it was Australia <laughs> Julie was like, what was, that? what was that? Uh that was that was Mois. Most. Um, it was supposed to be an unveiling, but what ended up happening was that MnDOT went ahead and put out all the signs on Thursday. So the unveiling was supposed to happen yesterday, Monday. And uh, there was a, a bunch of stuff that was going on in the background that that kind of nothing we can discuss. <laughs> but there was there was reasonings why that happened, but nothing I can discuss. But it happened. But it happened. So MnDOT put out all the signs on Thursday. So instead of really an unveiling, what ended up happening was is they kind of did a sign inauguration. That wasn't the title of it. That's the title that I gave it. Right. Um, 
but um, it was here was the thing. I said, "Hey, we'll cover it live," but, <laughs> but I had no plan. I had I was like, I don't know exactly how I'm going to do this. I'm here in Atlanta. I was like, how, "What do I do?" Uh, <laughs> You're like, "Well, one of us will be over there. One of us will be over there, and oh, we'll I, cover it." <laughs> so I started contacting people, and I said. I know you're going to be there. Uh, can you please cover it for us? Because, you know, uh, and if you missed it, if you missed it, it's on Facebook and it's on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. So you can actually check it out there. But um, it was really, really cool because I was able to, um, there were some people that got their phones and I gave them the StreamYard links and they were able to live just like we're doing right now, they were able to live into the show and show us what was going on there. Awesome. Um, so I want to give a special shout out to the people that did that. Uh, Audrey Johnson from Purple Genealogy. Uh, Mark Webster, obviously the gentleman who put together the whole entire scenario. The he reason. Was, he's the reason why this highway got named the way that it got named. Yes. Um, and uh, he actually had some he he handed out to jay gave it to ja who gave us front row seats to everything mm. uh also shout out to ashley mccourt funkatopian who was there and craig alexander from prince day houston was also there they all live streamed and whoever had the better view we kind of just switched between uh switch between them and i did take some um i did take some screen captures from the video that came out the first uh i'll share a couple of screen captures the first is uh, uh the former chanhassen mayor denny and dr fink both of which spoke directly to us on the show so it was cool because jay was taking it around and you know denny uh, denny spoke awesome. directly into it dr fink spoke to what was funny is when dr fink came on he didn't say anything about the sign. <laughs> he was promoting St. Paul and the and the All Star with the the Funk All Stars, Minneapolis Funk All Stars. He was that's he was promoting. He was promoting a show, and he didn't even. I mean, that's not why he was there. He was there to honor the moment. But when he was on video, that's all that he talked about, which was funny. But it was so cool because you know, Doctor Fink has been on the show before. He's a great guy. I love talking to him whenever they come through Atlanta. Um, well, he used to come through Atlanta with Purple Experience because he was playing keyboards for Purple Experience um, originally. And matter of fact, Dr. Fink was the one who put together Purple Experience. And it was really cool to go see them because what was amazing was you actually had Dr. Fink playing all these keyboard parts. The, the guy who programmed most of that stuff. Right. And that was just, it was just, it was amazing when, but then he, he left and um, it's still an amazing project, but anyways, and I want to go ahead and apologize right out of the gate um, because uh, I had like multiple senior moments during, <laughs> during this broadcast. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I, um, because <laughs> Uh, what's Denny's last name? Mayor Denny's last name? H Hoffman, Le Hoffman Le It's like a, a really confusing name. But for whatever reason, multiple times I called him Mayor Denny Jarman because I had a friend who was a paraplegic named Denny Jarman who passed away in 2012. And for some reason, his 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 name got stuck in my head. <laughs> and I didn't catch myself until the third time that I said it. And then I was like, hey, Denny Jarman, that's not his name. And then there was another time when Craig Alexander and Sharon Nelson were standing next to each other under the sign and the camera was panning. And I said, and I said, and there's Craig Nelson. <laughs> and it, as, this, as these words are coming out of my mouth, I'm thinking, I really need a break. <laughs> We, we need a show. <laughs> we need a show where every name we just say wrong. It just doesn't matter who it is. 
<laughs> it was <laughs> luckily, you know, you're talking about like seconds that were yeah. it was happening, but it was just like, what is going on with my brain that I can't? It's like I, I'm I'm remembering names really, really well, but then these like pieces are just kind of just happening. But anyways, so yes, we what's really really cool because all we were going to do is just broadcast the live what was happening there so that we could hear you know mark talking and hear sharon talking but then not only that we ended up getting mayor denny on the phone uh, on the on the live stream we got dr fink on the live stream plus on top of that also got mark webster speaking on the live stream and sharon talking on the live stream and of course there's a picture of the actual sign up but so we got all these people that were actually talking on the live stream. It's great. And the other thing that kind of fell apart was this video card that's in this system is just, I guess, whatever came with the system and it desperately needs to be upgraded. Mm. And because all this stuff was going on, my system started freezing up and everything was frozen. But apparently all the live streams were still going, but I just got kicked off and it was, I was gone. And I was I was freaking out because I thought that it was just I thought oh no right it's, you know everybody's getting cut off this sucks oh my gosh but that's not what was happening at all everybody was watching all the live streams that were happening Craig right. Alexander's live stream and and JA's live stream and all these live streams that were happening but I just wasn't there <laughs> <laughs> and so, so there <laughs> and you can't end the broadcast. Awesome. You, so basically what you do is with StreamYard is that you just close the tab, just exit out of the tab. And then when you go back into the StreamYard main thing, you, you go back into the meeting, like, and it just pops you back in. Like you were so bathroom break. Yeah. It was just like, I just had to, you know, go or something. I don't know. Uh, but anyways, it was great because it was totally unplanned that way. Um, and then of course we got this, we got there's Craig Alexander. So again, this is a big thanks to Craig Alexander. Yes. That's them in from the sign. Audrey Johnson from Purple Genealogy. Yes. Um, and then of course uh, there's Mark Webster, who's also speaking with Joel King. Many who don't know Joel King, he was the one who kind of put together that Prince Museum with the bronze Prince statue, and the one that they had in um, in that faraway town. I can't remember the name of it right now. Yeah. Um, and now it's in the Minneapolis Music Museum, and um, it's just, it's very, very cool. And um, so all these people were speaking. We caught all of it. If you missed any of that, you can, it's the live, excuse me, that live stream is there. It's on yeah. YouTube. It's on Facebook. You can still check it out. Same with here. I'm it's not putting this out on Spotify or um, iHeartRadio because it was a very, very, very visual live stream. Uh most of the time, you know, they're walking around and you can see all the people milling about. And I saw so many people that were there. Nadine, I saw Nadine, I saw Nadine. I saw, um, did I say I saw Nadine? Uh, <laughs> uh, I saw uh, Nick Garcia there. There were so many people. There were so many Funkatopians that were walking around, which was really, really cool. And again, shout, super shout out to to all these fine folks that um, that were there. It's really, really awesome to it was just great because thank you, Sandra, the town of Henderson, because it was just, um, it was just so surprising that we were doing just a live stream just to kind of show what was happening there. And it ended up being an entire show and a it was the middle of the yeah. day. And, uh, I just took an extended lunch break and I was like, this is happening. <laughs> uh, somebody has got to do it. Cause it's like, I'm like, all right, is anybody going to cover this at all? Is this popping up? And I'm like going to all the print sites, looking to see if anybody's doing anything and nobody's doing anything. And I'm like, is Paisley well, Park broadcasting it? I was like, nope, Paisley Park's not broadcasting it. Uh, yeah. Is Londell broadcasting it? Nope, Londell. Charles? Nope, nobody's broadcasting. Matter of fact, what I found interesting was, is that, um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll just say this flat out, but I'm not sure the reasoning but neither Londell McMillan or Charles Spicer were there for that signed inauguration event, mm -hmm. which I found, I just kind of found it surprising. Now I do know that they were kind of doing their own thing over at Paisley park, but the reality of it was, is that everybody knew 
they had even moved their timing from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock in order not to conflict with this event. So they right. knew this event was happening. So there wasn't necessarily anything that was going on. And it's not like they have to be part of the day-to-day -day operations of Paisley Park. So I, I was just surprised that those two weren't there or that didn't, they didn't make an appearance. Right. Um, right. It, there could have been, I mean, there could have obviously been a reason for it, but then I saw this tweet that said, and this was from a, uh, this is from a, uh, a, I guess an account named Prince hits and he, or she said not too much to see at Paisley park. It's more like an open house. The store and small stage are open to the public. Great to see so many Prince fans here. Oh, and I did get to see Londell McMillan play some hoops. Come and support Prince. Uh, and then, of course, they kind of showed the, the thing there. I was like, what now? Mm. Uh, so, and, I, and, I, and at first, at first, I was like, oh, so I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah. Um, anyways, but what what I I finally got to the bottom of that. Um, and I'm going to have to pull this back up because I had to move this because I was like, so how yeah. did they see him play basketball? Because like the basketball court is, right. um, yeah. is we haven't, nobody's kind of seen that, but right. uh, check this out. This is on Instagram. I will pull, let me just make sure this is not auto playing. It is. Hold on a second. Uh, it is. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to share this because. Yeah. This is what they did at Paisley Park. Let me pull this up. And let's see. This is I'm I really got to replace this video card. <laughs> All right. So here is what they're doing. That whole area where you know they had the tents where everybody was eating for the celebration and whatnot. They are putting a break, a big print logo in the middle of the courtyard there, and a basketball hoop, as you can see right there. So essentially what they're doing outside of Paisley Park is they're putting this they're putting this logo um out there <laughs> right outside of Paisley Park. So that's that seems to be what's going on. So mm -hmm. there is a new it says a new highway and a new courtyard and that's that kind of explains why they may have been playing basketball was because they've got a basketball court out there. So Right. There you go. All right. Anyways, still, still surprised that they weren't there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It is what it is. Again, it's, it's, it's just, I, 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 I always think that I'm starting shit and I'm not. Um, but I, I think that with Min dot, not, um, with Min dot putting the signs out on Thursday, what mm -hmm. ended up happening is that. I think it kind of took the wind out of a lot of people's sails as far as, you know, the surprise, the surprise of it because yeah. now all of a sudden that they were going to be going to see and be the first person to see. Now, all of a sudden it's all already all over the news. It's all over all the papers and right. it's just there. Yeah. Um, and I also heard that uh, on Friday night, uh, it was very dead on Friday night for DJ said, I think it was DJ Dudley D. I think that was there, but uh, someone that was there, um, said that there was like 40 to 50 people at the peak of the night in first Avenue. First Ave. Wow. It's like, it's in most of the time it was like a couple dozen. Mm. I was like, that's not a good look. Interesting. So, all right, let's move on to, to more, to more happier things. Uh, I think that's important to move on to happier things. All right. Mm. We taught, we've talked about this a couple of times. Um, uh, yes, Francis, thank you so much. Yes, we en I enjoyed being there for sure uh, in <laughs> in the virtual world, like all of <laughs> you. Uh, but I'm glad that we were able to pull it off. And um, anyways, all right. So we've talked a couple of times about uh, new music that is coming or that is being announced. And right. Londell even announced on Twitter, he said that there was a an announcement of new music coming in August. So one of the things that I am going to share with you is confirmed. The other thing is that rumor slash conjecture now, and the only reason why I'm even saying it as rumor and conjecture, 
is only because is not, has not been officially announced, but I have heard from a very, very reliable source that this is what's happening. And uh, I just heard from a reliable source that this is what's happening and that they've actually heard pieces of it that are going, that are part of this box set. Yes. It's a, there's a box set coming. So let me, let me, we'll, we'll talk about the thing that we know about that is not as exciting as a box set, but still pretty cool nonetheless. And that is the re-release of Graffiti Bridge on vinyl. Hmm. And how we know it is a done deal, obviously, <laughs> when they're releasing all the albums on vinyl, they're pretty much just redoing whatever. Um, right. And But this is a screen capture from the Target app. Um, <laughs> so Target's already got it posted for pre-order. Pre-order. Uh, yeah, for pre-order. Mm -hmm. uh, so Target's already got it pre-ordered. And I want to say, I can't, the screen's too small right now. I can't read that date on that uh, uh shipping date uh by release date friday september 8th all right so september 8th is when this vinyl is coming uh so there's that so so uh yeah everybody wants to know about the box set and we i was under the impression that um i was under the impression that it was going to be parade just because of all the pieces and all the things that have been happening with the release of uh, Under the Cherry Moon on a lot of the movie platforms, all of a sudden, right. they just right. kind of popped up. You know, you used to have to just buy it, rent it, purchase it, whatever. And yeah, it seemed like a lead in. Yeah, it seemed like they were kind of just, this is what was happening. Right. Now, again, I've treat everything that you hear as rumor and conjecture. I don't know Jack. <laughs> I am not an official. I am not an official word on anything. So just, you know, just call me out if you want. I don't really care. But grain of salt. Just take grain it. Of salt. But apparently he, there's already pieces that are floating around and we've got a box set coming for diamonds and pearls. <clears throat> so, <laughs> uh, yes. So I was kind of interested in, um, Here's a couple of things. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a look at this. What and don't I, I told you I am not a prince guru. I mean, a lot of people think I am, all my friends and family do, but there's a bunch of stuff that I, you know, can't can't completely commit to memory for whatever reason, just because I'm old. You know. <laughs> Anyways, Diamonds and Pearls came out in 1991. So my original thought was, okay, if this is going to get a treatment like the previous box sets, mm. what songs were recorded that were unreleased? Um, you know, what songs were recorded that were unreleased that came out in 1991? So I was like, all right, I need to look this up. And so, of course, I've got my, um, I don't, where, where did I have this stored? Um, oh, I'm looking at the wrong, the wrong drive. That's why. Um, here are some songs and I'm going to go back and look at the songs that were in, that came out in 1991 that were recorded, but never released. Oh, hmm. shoot. I don't have it in. I have hmm. medical, but I don't have them. I do have them in here. Okay, so let's let's just go over here. I, my apologies. I I should have been prepared for this, but this is just something I just thought about uh, right here out of the gate. All right, 1991. We have. You can almost consider that 1990 may be. Um, it might be included in this mix too, uh, because, right. you know. If Graffiti Bridge, unless Graffiti Bridge gets a box set treatment in the future, which it may, um, there are some songs like Love Left, Love Right. You guys may have heard that. Love to the left of me, love to the right. Um, love Left, Love Right. They've got a lot of songs from Robin Power that was on, uh, that did not make it onto the Graffiti Bridge um, one. <laughs> you, we, we play that little, we play a little snippet of her all the time. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of stuff from her work. She had a whole album mm -hmm. and 
kind of got pushed up. And then you have exploding all over Europe with Rosie Gaines, which I don't think ever really got a full, really good treatment. But there was all that stuff that he had with George Clinton that was happening. But let's look at 1991 specifically in that Diamonds and Pearls era. You've got the juice. That song I just did the city. You've got the juice. Turn it up. I was just talking about that. Yes. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but Prince wrote that song uh, that for Ray Charles that he did for that Pepsi Kirk commercial. You've got the right one, baby. Uh-huh. There is a whole song that goes with that that you may or may not have heard called uh-huh um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, there's also get blue i hear your voice which was uh uh i think it was a rosie Gaines song i'm trying to remember who it was i uh, this is my house there's a bunch of carmen outtakes and whatnot um there's not a whole bunch of stuff he wasn't really in that type of writing mode so i am curious what this box set is going to have i mean mm. i'm looking at a total of 25 songs and some of which have kind of come out in some form or fashion, like in weird releases, you know, how Prince does things. You just kind of, you know, would put out something in a weird way, like gangster right. glam and things like that and clock in the jazz instrumental clock in the jizz. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that are out there that could feasibly be on this box set. So I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's um, going to be an interesting one. Oh, Brian says, dude, you're not old. You're not old. I'm not old. With the laughing yeah. uh -huh emoji. Yeah. I, it's, yeah. I mean, 54, but midlife for me would mean that I would have to live to 108, which is <laughs> <laughs> right. a little past midlife. <laughs> well, yeah. We're, you know, I'm just, you know, anyways. So that's what's happening in that regard. Um, and again, rumor and conjecture. That's okay. all we're going to say on that. But I've heard it from a very, very good source that that's what's happening. And um, this person has given us information before a few times, and it it happened. <laughs> so that's all I've got to say. Uh, anyways, um, Stacy said... I wonder if there have been multiple Michael Jackson releases, re-releases like we get of Prince. Um, I'm only aware of this is an escape. Actually, Casey Rain talked about this on Twitter because I had actually asked him. Um, I had actually asked him. We talked about this at the celebration. Casey and I were sitting down uh, at the celebration and people were like, oh my gosh, Casey Rain and Mr. Christopher are sitting together. And I was like, shut up. <laughs> so stupid. Um, but uh, Casey said there are for unreleased music from Michael. He said he is only aware of about two albums worth of unreleased music from Michael Jackson. Mm. Mm. And when you think about that in the scope of mm. this release, <laughs> it's just where they're like never ending. They seem to be just like a, a never ending. We know that's not the case. We know that that's not a, it's, it's not a never ending. Right. Cool. We, we, we don't, we knew that. Um, I don't know. So, but yeah, uh, Casey said he's only aware. And Casey is like a hardcore Michael Jackson fan. He loves Prince and Michael Jackson, probably about equally the same, but he really has some serious love for Michael Jackson. And he's one of these guys. He kind of knows like about as much as Michael Jackson as I know about Prince, probably more about Michael. But um, he said he's only about two albums of unreleased material that he knows for, of that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that he can confirm and he knows a lot so all right um so let's talk about this for a second too i don't know if you guys saw this on facebook or not but um brown mark did a post on mm -hmm. facebook it was about seven minutes long and he was apologizing for not as you can see brown mark looks drastically different right um and uh cuz he's all sha he's he's unshaven which unshaven yeah <laughs> cuz normally he hides all that gray by shaving um but he just let it go and um he has apparently been gone for months now and everybody was kind of like what's going on right and he revealed that he um he apparently had some type of um 
some type of autoimmune disease that he was fighting that um, has been laying dormant from childhood, according to the doctors. So wow. it was something, some type of autoimmune disease that was laying that he had as a kid and had been laying dormant and just kind of raised its head. And so now he, he got really, really sick and his manager forced him to go to um, go to the, the hospital. And uh, a big part of this seven minute video that he did mm -hmm. was kind of talking about how men need to just kind of stop doing this, you know, macho crap and go see a doctor. If you, if, if you're sick, don't be like, Oh, I don't need to, I can handle it. Uh, hmm. Get over that. Go do what you got to do. And um, so he kind of came on and, you know, you, you, you know, I, I'm used to seeing Brown Mark. I've had Brown Mark on the show uh, a few times. And uh, I, so it was like really shocking to see him with glasses and, you know, his grown out beard and he's lost like a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it was like, Oh my God, what, what's happened here. And um, so uh, prayers up for Brown Mark and uh, right. He did say that he's getting better and that everything's going good. And he's, he said he's looking to you know, make some music and get back out on the road soon. So, yeah. and I would imagine uh, we definitely want him to get better since next year we'll be looking at the 40th anniversary of Purple Rain. Purple Rain. So, we, so I would imagine that there is going to be some type of scenario where I, I just can't imagine the revolution not touring to support the 40 year anniversary. Right. I, I'm just envisioning something like a, gosh, man, if we could do something where you have a, like a big screen version <laughs> concert yeah. show where you're watching Prince on and, and the whole band's there actually playing. And Oh my God, that would just be phenomenal. That would be phenomenal. I just, you know, and it would sell out. I mean, I think it would sell out anywhere it went. So, Everywhere they went. I mean, so this is the vision that I have for what, you know, I'd like to see happen for. I want them to do something really, really awesome for 40th. And I imagine that there's going to be something very, very cool that will happen in regard to the 40th anniversary of Purple Rain at the next celebration next year. So, right. Well, definitely prayers up for Brown Mark. That's, we, we want him to be, you know, be better get yeah, better of course and of course um we um that's all the prince related news that we have for you here which well, obviously we you guys love to hear so there it is um let's talk about a couple of different things that were in the news <laughs> one of the things i said i was not going to talk about and it's not on the list here we we talked about that big issue that the big major fight that happened in montgomery uh where for those who haven't seen the video, I don't know, or or haven't watched it, I don't know where you've been hiding or what hole you're in, but it is like everywhere. It was on the news. It was on, it was like literally a whole, like what seemed like a 10 minute video of just people fighting each other. In, fighting. And it was very much, um, people made it out to be like a, a, like a race war type of thing. And it really kind of looked like that too. Uh, because what ended up happening was there was a big riverboat that was trying to get into the dock where they're supposed to be. The, that's where the riverboat is supposed to dock. But there was a bunch of drunk white people. <laughs> that's what they were that were on a pontoon boat that were parked at the dock that would not move their pontoon boat so that the riverboat could pull in. And the riverboat guy, captain waited for what was like 10 minutes for this pontoon boat to get out of the way and then what ended up happening is <laughs> the co-captain who is a really big burly black guy comes out and confronts one of the the guys for or one of the, the actually a lady from the pontoon boat and said let's let's go <laughs> let's you need to move this pontoon boat so we can pull this river boat in and the lady lunges at him this is like heavy set white lady lunges at him and she he he pushes her to the side and then all melee breaks loose because it's a big black guy like pushing a white lady to the side who lunged at him. Oh boy. And then all these white guys came out of nowhere and just started attacking this black guy. 
Now you're probably asking why are you bringing race into this? Well, because then what happened? Was, <laughs> because what had happened was what happened was <laughs> then a bunch of um, various black folk that <laughs> happened to be in the area up on the dock started one, was saw that there was a bunch of white people attacking this black guy, and they all came to to assist. And it became an absolute melee on this dock of just, it, it, it was it was just an absolute melee. There was even one guy who was on, who was working on a boat that was a charter boat who saw what was going on. And he was like probably 30 yards away from the dock, jumped, dove off of the boat, swam 30 yards or more, probably even more, over to the dock, black guy gets up and then he joins in on the fight. It's like if I swim 30 yards or 40 yards in the ocean now, we're not talking about like on a lake, um, we're talking about like ocean, you know, swimming and then get up on a dock. I am not in fighting mode. <laughs> I'm like, just, just give me a second. Just give me a minute. You got <laughs> Jeremy said Jimmy Buffett fans. <laughs> Jimmy Buffett fans would be a a, a, a very so good explanation. Uh, yeah, it would be a very good explanation of of uh, <laughs> if you wanted to get a visual of what these you know. Anyways, we didn't save the share the video here, or save the video, but you know that's kind of the melee. What's the the piece de resistance of this whole thing is that nobody got arrested. The, right, the police actually came and. One of the white lady actually attacked one of the, the, the cops and the cop had to push her off like violently. Then there was like one scene where this black guy comes over with a folding chair and slams it over this white lady's head who's sitting down. She's not even doing anything. She's sitting <laughs> down and he slams her over the head with a folding chair. Nobody got arrested. Hey, man. They all got misdemeanors. That lady should have known though, man. It's a, it's a bar fight. You got to get out of the bar. <laughs> you know, just sit around. And there were so many funny moments. I I actually do wish that I I I do Ooh. actually wish that I had gotten that home. Okay, everybody's asking me to to, to share this now. Show the clip. Like, uh, show okay. The clip. I mean, it, 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 it's a long <laughs> time. There's also there's like a whole bunch of of funny moments in this too. Uh, I think the funnier moments are there's yeah. one scene where this white guy uh, apparently thinks that he wants to step in and he's going to like <laughs> he's going to like totally blast somebody well, i don't know he's going to blast somebody but he's like he's going to be in a situation I, I, I can't go to like who's with me I gotta... <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah no he's he kind of goes over and he's like you know he's all bowed up like he's ready to fight but then what ends up happening is is that he all, all these black guys come around the corner and he realizes, oh, I am, I am absolutely outnumbered here. I'm going the other way. <laughs> with me. The rest of them said, nah. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of, uh, there's a bunch of four minute clips, but I want to find the one that is. Um, oh man, you're going to have to handle that by yourself. Good luck. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, yeah, th there's like four minute clips and, and five, I, I guess I'll just do the three minute clip because I mean, we're not going to do the whole three minute clip, but no. we'll, we'll talk over it. Um, but where is it at? Oh my gosh. It, 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 it is this the CNN one or, uh, no, this is actually, yeah, this is actually somebody talking over this one, but I'll, I'll, so I'll mute it yeah. and we'll just, we'll just show it. Cause it's just, <laughs> it we'll, is like, we'll pretend like, we'll make up words for what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and and they're actually calling this guy that jumped from the okay. So yeah. this is the co-captain who was already pushed by this white and the white guy started it first, and so now it's on, and mm. now all of these all these white guys just kind of come over and they're just like, all right, let's all get in here. And of course, you see this black guy up top. He's just like, he said, oh, I'm coming. What is going on here? And there's all these people that are just kind of running in here. And look the at the women are throwing hits, man. I think. <laughs> This is a black guy, and now he's trying to come in and, and try to, you know, kind of stop the situation a little bit and was like, and now here comes somebody else. 
What's funny is, is the guy that's recording this, that guy in the that water swimming from jumped, the- <laughs> jumped 50 yards off of this dock and then swam fr- from a, a charter boat and swam over to join in on the fight. Now he's kicking off his shoes. He's kicking off his wet clothes and he's joining all these other folks uh, <laughs> in the go. mix. Oh, they're showing this little, this little, <laughs> they're showing this wrestling clip. All right. So then they're going over and confronting these people that are in the, the well, now we're all pulling our pants up. moon, the pontoon boat. And now it's on <laughs> and now it's on. Now it's a whole melee and everything is just kind of, it's now just, it doesn't matter. Now it's free for all. Yeah, now absolutely, it's a, it's a total free for all. There, look, this, this lady is down. <laughs> Do you oh see how, man, you it hurts. I mean, the there, are, this lady right here in the blue, she's down there on the ground, covering herself, and there's people that are just like this girl in the blue is just trying to get out, and then look, this cop is just like, oh well, you know, uh, you guys need to move, move it on, move it on, and it's just like keeps on going. They <laughs> push the one guy in the water. There's the riverboat that's been trying to pull in, but the pontoon boat is sitting right there. I don't know if this is clip is going to actually show. Yeah, that's the way. Uh, hey, we don't want we want no smoke. We, we out. We out. Uh, nope, too late. You in, you inserted yourself into this mix, yeah, and now you, walked, you stepped up. You, you stepped uh, up, yeah. and that girl yeah. in the blue shirt should have stayed on the boat, and she keeps on injecting herself. And then yeah. here's here's more fights breaking out. It's just like, do you not? This is and insane. Lining them up. I mean, okay, and I think this is where that lady in red is the one that uh, it's she. Look, this they're just throwing bunch <laughs> randomly, dude. And I think, yeah, this is a lady. Yeah, the red. There's the lady in red that's sitting down there. And now she's being kicked, and here comes somebody she's with the folding kicked. chair. Here oh. comes the folding chair right now. Here comes <laughs> this guy. Oh is everybody with the folding. <laughs> it's that guy with the folding chair. That girl that's over on the. It's horrible. That lady that's sitting over on the, the other side, they're like kicking her and knocking her out. Look at that. He just came over and just stay down. <laughs> hold her chair. Okay. This whole thing is just to look. And the cop is right there. Cop's that's a like, cop. Right hit him there. again. I mean, stop. So now, because of the fact that he's, you know, struck this woman, assaulted yeah. this woman with this folding chair, even though there's assault going everywhere, this, lady's, this cop's like, get <laughs> back, lady. Just drink your beer and go away. And uh, it's just the whole thing is just total melee. What is amazing to me in that amid oh. all this insanity is that nobody got arrested. Every single one of them just got a misdemeanor. Every single one of them it just got a misdemeanor, including the guy who slammed the chair over multiple people's heads i i only saw the one when i watched the first watch the video but i now i see him over there just wailing away with the chair it's that's just insane to me it's just can't we all just get along jackals yeah. versus lions we had you had <laughs> just oh is that's mayhem that's just ridiculous right there it's just, I it just, these white folk, man. <laughs> Everybody was showing their ass in that one, just That's so true. we're clear. Everybody One's was. Day, but, but, everybody was. But when you get five or six white folk that start this whole thing, you know, it's going to get finished. <laughs> yeah, it's going to get finished. It's. it's <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. Uh that uh yeah, it's been it's been ridiculous. Anyways, all right. That um chair though. Yeah. He was swinging that chair. It was bending when he was hitting people. You can see it fold <laughs> and curve. Like, that's a hit. Hitting a hat. That's like watching wrestling the old Von Erics and the Freebirds or something. I mean, they were swinging chair. He was swinging. <laughs> <laughs> was not playing uh, all right so uh all right so that's enough of that i wasn't even going to talk about that but it was just it's been all over um all over twitter also what was all over twitter a few days earlier oh, and i'm not done with this i'm sorry i was waiting for jimmy right. superfly snooker to jump off that top rope <laughs> well it, there was a video clip of that guy um somebody was recording from that charter boat 
from behind where that guy jumped off the charter boat. I'm not going to go through the process of finding that video, but yeah. he was like, you can see him like standing and like, you know, going up and down the, uh, the railing, just like, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? And he just says, screw it. And screw he it. dives yeah. over and you, he doesn't like put his wallet and phone off to the side, <laughs> whatever he had in his pockets went with him. And, uh, he, he just <laughs> went over and I was, so here's how I saw this video, which is funny because I get on Twitter and I obviously want to keep up with the news. But then uh, I saw the hashtag Black Aquaman. <laughs> and I said, and my first thought was, are they making an Aquaman? Are they making a Black Aquaman movie? Is that what's happening here? I was like, I got to see what this is. And I clicked on it and that's all that this was. I was more like, like Aqua oh, Velva because if he was Aquaman, Nah, man, that's more like Aqua Velva. If he was Aquaman, <laughs> he would have had the dolphins bring him over. He would have swam the whole thing. This is not Aquaman. I was like, this is <laughs> way worse than the movie <laughs> thing. Ever. This is tuna. This is chicken of the sea. He shouldn't have done <laughs> Aquaman. I thought the movie thing was going to upset me, but... Uh... <laughs> And, and you know, may not admit it, but if you watch, by the time he got to the dock and got up ready to fight, he was moving a little bit slow. He was like, "I hope I don't have to swing right away. <laughs> I got to recover for a minute because that's a that's some serious stroke he was doing." He was like, "I'm ready." Oh yeah, well, you got to see the whole thing from when he jumps over the railing and so I'm gonna let you guys find that. <laughs> we just come and he just like, <laughs> man. And uh, they actually did some research on this guy and they showed him like working out at the gym and he's like running backwards on the, the treadmill and stuff. And it's like, Oh, this kind of explains this guy is like, like, I'm ready. He's that's like, dope. I mean, Hey, it's whatever he was. Hey, he went to help. And that's, that's, Hey, that is so much better than just recording and not helping or trying to break it up or not doing anything. Uh, you know, he was like, uh, uh-uh. no. Yeah. I mean, most folks, would record stay just, on the boat just, just <laughs> stay on the boat and record it so that you had so that you got the clip you know i mean that's the whole thing is just you know being able to record and just record it mm-hmm. um and not get hurt <laughs> in the process i it's t- you can't watch somebody being ganged up on Right. The energy, man. Job. That co-captain was there to come off and say, look, you need to move your yep. frigging pontoon boat. You're not supposed to be here. That riverboat's supposed to be here. And then all of a sudden, all these ignorant-ass white people come over and start ganging up on this guy. You're asking for trouble. They because- got the right response, in unfortunately. Alabama, I mean- in Montgomery, Alabama? <laughs> come on now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Come on. You might have got away of that North Dakota. Yeah, just... <laughs> That's not happening in Montgomery, Alabama. No, uh, not at all. I I agree with Stacy Stacy Boyd. Uh, like that's that's really the thing right there. I just can't imagine just watching an older man getting jumped like that. And that's kind of what it was like. Wait a second, what is going on over here? So you know, <laughs> it's just insane to me. I just don't. I just. I don't... Uh... I can't, I don't, it's just, it's, it's just too much to watch. Yeah. I, I'd have been the same way. I would have, I, I mean, I, I believe I don't fight like that. I mean, I haven't fought in many, 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 many years. So I certainly, if I didn't eject in myself, I'd have gotten my ass kicked. You might not uh, have made this swim, Chris. <laughs> I, I, no, I absolutely would not have made the swim. Cause if I was that guy, my first thought would not be, I'm going to jump. I'm going to swim. My out of shape ass, fifty <laughs> yards over to that duck, and then I'm gonna fight. I yeah. see you halfway. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing but your hand coming up. One, you like, you like swim and turn her back around to the charter boat. Throw the lifesaver. <laughs> hey, come back in, doggy Stop. paddling. Like shit. <laughs> what was I thinking? And then I'd be yelling from the lifesaver. Get him. <laughs> <laughs> <Some oxygen. laughs> Help! Hey, hey. When you're done over the help, I I I feel like it's one of those things where <laughs> you don't know what you would have done, but I, I feel kind of similar to that whole concept, man. The guy jumping, I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering because I know I've I've jumped into things that I may not have had my business in when I see certain situations, and that might have been one of them. 
That this might have been one of them. I don't. It depends on how much I had to drink. You know, just I it's, mean, it's, my it's, luck. I think I'm jumping off the boat and I face plant. <laughs> you know, yes. Belly flop as you're jumping over. I'm coming. Smack <laughs> black. Oh, <laughs> I didn't get over the railing. Never mind. Is there anything to grab onto on the side of this boat? I gotta get back out. I'm gonna swim around to the back of the ladder. I'm just gonna stand here and throw punches from a distance. Never this is my mind. virtual punch. My, vir my VR hits. Huh. Huh. <laughs> That'd been like the kill, 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 kill. Finish him. From <laughs> Hashtag Black Aquaman. You can look it up. It's still there. Help. <laughs> speaking of interjecting yourself where you shouldn't let's go ahead and segue into uh let's go ahead and segue into this next one because that, that montgomery thing was something we were, wasn't even on the radar i was just it was on the radar but i was like i don't need to talk about this we're gonna talk about it anyway screw it we're gonna talk about it <laughs> Uh, because we, we were already having fun talking about not talking about it on the pre-show, and we was like, I guess we're going to end up talking about it. So I can't stop. <laughs> All right. Uh, Harry, Henry, I'm coming, Beanie Boy, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. Uh, Help. Help. You know, I'll be, I'll be doing a little Sanford. I'm coming, Wheezy. Uh, All right. the big one. So, Jamie Foxx said something on Twitter that caused a big kerfuffle. <laughs> I love using that word. There it is. There it is. Kerfuffle. Um, and apparently, all right, I'm going to let you read this. Yeah. Don't, don't look at this through any other eyes. Other just, just let's just say this is not from Jamie Foxx. <laughs> Okay, let's ignore this is from Jamie Foxx. Ignore just okay. This is what Jamie Foxx posted on Twitter. He said, They killed this dude named Jesus. What do you think they'll do to you? Hashtag fake friends, hashtag fake love. Immediately, uh everybody thought that they were he was talking about jewish people because the jews did kill jesus <laughs> yeah okay, now i i hear you i hear you this is a, the immediate thought that came over people over people's mind okay mm -hmm. uh i get it i can see where they thought that <laughs> read into somebody's words yeah heck yeah yeah i can i can see that this is twitter this this is where you read something and you kill. that's the reason why texting is such a bad idea right out of the gate just because of the fact that you they don't know your intonations they don't know but I, this is like kind of laid out and you can kind of read between the lines but apparently that's not what he meant by this he was just talking about Hashtag, that's the reason why it says hashtag fake friends, where he's more speaking about Judas. He's talking about the fact that you got somebody that's close to you and they and they betray you. Yeah. And if you had read fake friends, fake hashtag, the hashtags, it it may have allowed you to rethink the thought of you're talking about these people. Oh, but that's not Twitter, my friend. That's not humans. <laughs> humans don't read all of everything. Now, do they? People don't want to think through this stuff. No. Why do you want what did I he say? All I heard. All I heard. So, this is the second white person interjection tonight where Jennifer Aniston got very upset and said, This really makes me sick. I did not like this Pope's on purpose or by accident. And more importantly, I want to be clear to my friends and anyone hurt by this showing up in their feeds, I do not support any form of anti-Semitism, and I truly don't tolerate hate of any kind, period. And she was specifically talking about Jamie Foxx's tweet because she had liked it or whatever. She had kind of posted it. I, I don't she know. She liked what. it, and then people questioned her. Yeah, and it did kind of it went haywire. Right. Well, Black Twitter got crazy on Jennifer. 
They went to town. And if you go, if you go to Twitter right now and you search for Jennifer Aniston, they let it was it was a it was a scene. It was just like it was like that Alabama doc scene is basically what it was with Jennifer <laughs> Aniston in the middle of the pile. It, they were hammering on her, just saying, just shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Stop talking. That's not what he meant. It, they laid into her. It was just, it was a whole, it was a whole thing. It was an, it was a whole thing. And one of the videos that I had seen, uh, I can't remember who, I can't remember who it was. It wasn't anybody famous, but they were, they were talking about something like they don't understand black culture and they don't. And it's, it's like, I don't under. So I did want to ask as somebody <laughs> maybe doesn't have insight to a lot of different things. Is this a black culture moment that I'm missing? Uh, what am I missing? Which part are you asking? I don't know what I'm missing. <laughs> I feel like Jennifer Aniston really, really got hammered because, again, you can read that tweet and you can absolutely translate it as an anti-Semitic comment. You absolutely positively can translate this into an anti-Semitic comment. Yes, you but can if you Aniston, don't. Right. But when Jennifer Aniston input her statement, they laid in on her. I mean, they just tore into her like she was some ignorant bitch. Right. Yeah, and, and that wasn't necessary either. What I didn't understand. What am I missing? No, what you're missing is what you're missing. Uh, no, I, they I, I, didn't I, read I, either. I, I, all they saw was her first line and said she's blasting all this. And and realistically, if you look at her, you know that that comment was her responding to the misunderstanding of whatever she's typing like of, of her liking it originally you know what i'm saying so it's i don't i think it's again misreading her tweet that's what i think yeah i i mean I, and then the rest of course because she's in her her lane of people when they blast her for liking his that's where she hears that this is anti-semitic this is this this is this is so she's not hearing everybody's perspective she's hearing her publicist and her people's perspective. So she's responding to that. That's why it turned into that. Yeah. So she liked it because apparently she's not that fake friend. Right. She, um, she probably everybody started, understood it. Everybody started attacking her and right. she wanted to make sure that it was very clear that she does not, because they were, because they didn't understand the post that Jamie had done. They, and because she liked it, they can, they accused her of anti-Semitism. And so she reacted this way and said, I do not support any form of anti-Semitism. I truly don't tolerate hate of any kind, period. She was just simply just laying out her position. I get what you're saying now. Right. And and then people, just like you said, they didn't understand. There was folks on the one side in the Jewish community that did not understand what Jamie had read or didn't read it all the way through. And same thing with, people's reaction to Jennifer Aniston was that they didn't, they tore into her because they were accusing her of being anti-Semitic. And she was like, that's not what happened at all. She, she said, I did not like this post on purpose or by accident. Yeah, And that, and that's the part that's crazy. And I did not like that, this post on purpose or by accident. It was a but drug that, click. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't mean to or not mean to. I, I may have or may not have. Click, mm. click. It clicked Whoop. itself. <laughs> oh, so she butt liked it. That's what it was. I, yeah. I didn't. <laughs> she was reading Jamie Foxx's tweet <laughs> or, or his feed. She put the phone in her pocket and she and sat like down it. right and she butt clicked. She it. butt liked it. It liked itself. That's <laughs> my phone. I don't know if anybody else's phone does, but this is legit. My phone calls people randomly. I will mm -hmm. have my phone in my pocket and I'll be sitting in the car and I'll sit here. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, mine does that too. <laughs> and then I like pull my phone out of a pocket and it's like randomly calling somebody. And it's just like, why did it's you? It's always me? the person I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> my phone's telling on me. <laughs> but all that being said, uh, Jamie did follow up with a post that said, "I want to apologize to the Jewish community and everyone who was offended by this post. I know my choice of words 
have caused offense. And I'm sorry. That was never my intent to clarify. I was portrayed by a fake friend. And right. that's what I meant with they, not anything more. I only have love in my heart for everyone. I love and support the Jewish community. My deepest apologies to anyone who has offended nothing but love always, Jamie Foxx. Right. And, and you know, when it's all said and done, they both got they both got blasted because people did not thoroughly try to process what was what they were reading and became reactionary on both sides. And then after that, it's just the global mindset. Once 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 half of a group and it doesn't matter what group it is, once half of a group of people start thinking one way, that just explodes, man. That snowballs. Just, there's nothing you can do about it. That mindset. So neither of them meant anything. That's what's crazy. Cammy says, I receive emails from you anytime you send something to someone. Somehow she got attached as like an admin or something on my stamps.com account. It's like anytime I send something, said, You sent this. I was like, I don't know how that like, happened. Cammy, I'll try to look into that. I don't know what. Cammy, you were trying to hack Funkatopia once and it's come back to haunt see, you. That's see. <laughs> So you took you, you let the producer title go to your head. See, that's what happens. <laughs> I, I I agree with Lisa here. Think before you tweet, because at the end of the day, you have to go. If I say this, <laughs> it's all a friggin' mess. It's, it's nothing totally... is safe. Nothing is safe. It doesn't oh matter. Oh my gosh, that outfit. Um, if I start okay. talking about custard again. <sighs> It's going to become, if I tweet about it, it's going to become like a big thing. And I'm nobody. We better get our songs. We better get our songs. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> That's right. We need to, we need to, we better get our songs. Michael about that. Yes, Sir Gabriel. Michael Gabriel. Uh, yeah. You got I'm two songs. Write the custard custard song. I'm just going to write it. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well. You got, uh, the, the album's on hold now. We got an extra track we got to put in. Uh, all right, let me close all this because it's just so all silliness. All right. I will say. So um, moving on, yeah, you to want to talk about one thing that did happen? Remember, uh, what, what was it last week? No, two weeks ago. Whatever it was, when we were talking about, <laughs> we showed the video of Cardi B throwing the mic at the uh, <laughs> at the um, the fan after getting splashed with with water or drink or whatever was in the Look drink. At this yeah, well, that outfit is the mic too tight. She threw sold on eBay <laughs> for a hundred thousand dollars. Now that tight. outfit. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say is that outfit is just too tight, girl. That outfit. That is... outfit. That outfit. That outfit is so tight you can't even hide the ads. What the ads are trying to come. In... <laughs> the what? Is... I hate websites to do this shit. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. I hate this. Uh, yeah. yeah. She her Offset's her mic sold be... for a hundred thousand dollars on eBay. Yeah, right. Just so you know. Okay, so. so the microphone that she chucked at the girl, or was it a guy? I thought it was a girl because it. Anyways, the, yeah, the whoever. microphone that she chucked sold for a hundred thousand dollars on eBay. Hundred hundred <laughs> out of all the songs she did after the WAP rapper, <laughs> out of all the songs she did. <laughs> You had to do WAP rapper, WAP rapper. coupled with that picture. <laughs> really? Okay, wow. then. Just just wow. Anyways. Uh, oh, you know the thing that was... Uh, <laughs> this, that's going to be a clip. It's going to haunt me. Um, <laughs> why are you getting these underwear commercials? <laughs> All right. Um, They've been following you. <laughs> I guess, though. It's just like... Hey, speaking of tight, special um, pocket, <laughs> penis pocket. Um, <laughs> what? All right, I'm done. Oh, good night, everybody. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> when the penis pocket ads start showing up, uh, anyways, <laughs> it's called a paradise pocket. I like penis pocket better. Here's something that I didn't know. Was that before that even happened, Cardi B had said something on on the stage saying that she wished somebody would spray her off to cool her off or something like that. It's, it's yeah. Saying something something to that effect, and that's why the person did that. And I don't remember. Oh, uh, 
The Grammy winner asked, there is right there. The Grammy winner asked fans to lightly spray her with water to cool her down. And then, oh. you know, it was that was a super soaker and <laughs> it just okay. went south. But think about it, man. Uh, it's kind of like flirting in the office. <laughs> How? <laughs> I, I, I got to see this connection. <laughs> it's, it's, it's harassment if I like you. Uh, I mean, it's harassment if I don't like you. It's, it's oh, it's innocent, whatever, if I do. So that was a fan she didn't particularly like all night. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, if you or I had thrown that water at him, oh, yeah. I'd be like, come get your mic. <laughs> He'd be like, tell me another one. <laughs> tell me some ice cubes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do the rolling R's thing, so. <laughs> can you roll it? Can you roll your R's? Roll. <laughs> Throw me some, hey, throw me some ice cubes. You got to do the occur. You got to do that. Occur. No, I, I, you can't do I'm that. Done. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I gotta, that's got to be a sound clip on our, I'm not, on our board. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I mean, I already got the one new sound clip, which I was very proud of. <laughs> Isn't that the kid can't make you? Uh, uh, Lauren says, Cardi's Korean now. Uh, <laughs> hey, I mean, <laughs> I never said I could do an, a good accent. Oh, no. You got another billboard link? Or they're going to add me to death again. No, you that. know what? I don't think we should even All right. go any further. I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think we've done enough damage for the night to get us canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you guys so, so much for tuning in. Obviously, if you missed any of the interview, that will be posted. Just the mick murphy because here's the thing and i try to share this with folks if we do interviews that's what gets posted up to spotify iHeartRadio, and stuff like that all of this stuff you're only going to catch it live or if you can scroll through the youtube videos of the unedited stuff and whatnot um but the we try to clean it up a little bit <laughs> on <laughs> <laughs> on Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Odyssey, and all that stuff. And yes, you can actually go to Spotify and search for Funkatopia, and we're there. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, I hope you guys had a fun time. Uh, next week, I don't I, look. <laughs> Man, look, I, look. I think I think I need to take a break. You've been killing it, killing it. Um, there's a couple interviews that are in place with some new artists that are coming out that you probably don't know. I don't know if we'll do a, a live show to support that. We'll probably, I'll probably pre-record it and then we'll, um, we'll post them at various times just to kind of make sure that you guys have something to watch and enjoy during that time. And, um, but I think I'm going to take next week off. I mean, unless something comes up, you know, if, you know, an artist comes that I've been trying to get on the show for a long time comes and says, can you do a show next week? Then that's what will happen. But right. In the meantime, yes, prayers up for Brown Mark. Um, make sure you, you you keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And um, go to Funkatopia.com slash Mick, M-I-C, and get that The Mighty Soulmates album for sure. Absolutely yes. positive picked it up. Also, support Funkatopia as well. We, you know, it is uh, not an easy thing that we do here. You can support us one-time donations on Venmo at Funkatopia, Cash App, dollar sign Funkatopia. That's F-U-N-K-A-T-O-P-I-A. And then, of course, we also have our monthly supporters at Patreon.com slash Funkatopia, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Funkatopia. And um, you can support us there and get all kinds of music files. Uh, sorry, Patreon supporters, that I have not uploaded those music files yet for this month. It's been a crazy month with all the stuff, the extra things that have been going on at mm -hmm. not just here and in Shanhassen with the inauguration, the sign inauguration thing, but work and everything has just been insane. Um, promise you, I'm trying to get better, but it's coming. It's coming right now. Uh, you you will have it. You will have it before the end of the week. And I got some really really cool stuff I'm going to share with you guys. So. Enjoy that. And yes. I hope you guys had a fantastic time. Thank you so, so much for hanging out this late. You know, it's just been. You know, yeah, we appreciate you guys. So, and once and 
And a final thank you again for um, those who did the broadcasts for us yesterday for the uh, memorial. Yes. Too. We shout out thank to you. Craig Alexander from Prince Day Houston and for Audrey Johnson from uh, Purple Genealogy. And of course, uh, Ashley McCourt, who's a Funkatopian, and Mark Webster and J.A., who gave us front row seats to all that stuff. If you want to watch the inauguration, it's really, really cool. We got live just talking to us, not like we weren't like third party. They were talking directly to Funkatopians. Sharon L. Nelson addressed us. Mark Webster addressed us. Dr. Fink addressed us. Mayor Denny addressed us. It was really cool. It was just going to be a live stream of what was going to be happening there. And then we ended up having this star studded event and uh, unexpectedly. That's always cool when that happens. It's like, oh, yeah. snap. We were just going to watch. But now all of a sudden, all we're this part thing. of it. <laughs> now we're now we're there. And what was really cool is that we were the only ones who did it. Yep. There are plenty of Prince focused groups that are out there that could have done something and should have done something and didn't. Even the that's, big, that's pretty mean for you really, to call them out. I I just I think it's it doesn't I mean I know it's in the middle of the day and people work and stuff, but you yeah, just should be somebody doing something. It's a tough one. It's a tough one to pull off. But no, somebody it did it. Some because no, <laughs> you're like nye, 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 nye. <laughs> it was easy as hell. No, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, it was a nightmare, but uh it was very cool that we got it done and if you want to watch the inauguration it was very very cool the side inauguration was very cool and thank you to mark webster and everybody and mick murphy for coming on the show and good night see you later adios amigos and amigas y amigas follow subscribe click it's okay It's okay if it's a butt click too. We don't even care how you subscribe or follow. We really don't. It's butt no big deal. All day. No big deal. We really don't care. Get out. Oh, Aaron Frigo's in the house. I'm excited all over again. <laughs>